Warning, the following podcast contains adult language, themes, and situations. Also, the film we're about to talk about is going to be spoiled thoroughly. Listener discretion is advised. Enjoy this show. In the early to mid-90s, films starring an antagonizing pain-in-the-ass character who slowly drops their guard only to realize the object of their animosity was actually their best friend all along were all the rage. While Driving Miss Daisy and The Bodyguard managed to gain critical and financial success respectively, Nicolas Cage's foray into this short-lived genre didn't go quite as well. But does this film deserve its place in relative obscurity? Or is it a lost gem? We'll find out as we break down the 1994 comedy drama, Guarding Tess. Okay, let's run. <laughs> I'm like a prickly pear. I... What do you say we cut the chit-chat a-hole? Porker, fuck. Porker, how did you burn? How did you burn? How did you burn? Hey, have you ever been dragged to the sidewalk and beat until you... Blood! Welcome to One Cage at a Time, the show where we break down every single Nicolas Cage movie, one film at a time. Here are your hosts, Patrick, Vince, and Nigel. A highly decorated Secret Service agent gets the assignment of his nightmare guarding a demanding, nitpicky former first lady. But, as we soon find out, there's more to their relationship than meets the eye and he's the only one she can trust to save her life. Ladies and gentlemen, here are your stars. Guarding Tess stars the legendary Oscar-winning actress who was also nominated for a Golden Globe for her role in this film, Shirley MacLaine, Eugene Tackleberry himself from Police Academy 1 through 7, David Graff, <laughs> a whole host of character actors including Austin Pendleton, who might be best known as Gurgle from Finding Nemo, James Rebhorn, <laughs> who you may recognize from every other TV show and movie ever made, Richard Griffiths, a.k.a. Vernon Dursley from the Harry Potter films, and of course, a man who really knows how to get information out of an uncooperative suspect, Academy Award-winning actor Nicholas Kim Coppola, better known as Nicholas Cage. Let's dive into the nitty gritty. Guarding Tess was released on March 11th, 1994 with a budget of $20 million, which is a lot in 1994 money, but it made $31 million. So it recouped, but didn't really turn much of a profit. Unlike films like, you know, uh, Driving Miss Daisy <laughs> and The Bodyguard, who kind of had this same trope. I, I notice this is a thing that just went through the 90s there mm-hmm. for a while. Yeah, uh, They don't really do many of these films anymore that I'm aware of. It's kind of uh, moved on to, like, parental figure and child, mm-hmm. Mandalorian, Last of Us, all that stuff. It's kind of moved into that trope now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's such an odd, gruff, reluctant thing. parental figure mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and, with a heart of gold. Yeah. They did so many of these movies for some reason in that short amount of time. It was like late eighties to mid nineties. And then they were like, nah, all right, that's done. Even we got our Oscars one. out of this. Let's, yeah. let's move on. <laughs> just like, you know, world war two movies there for a while. And Holocaust yeah. movies were just, I think it's all just the rage. <laughs> audiences tolerated for so long. And then they, they move on. Yeah. Yeah. Directed by Hugh Wilson, who also wrote and directed the first Police Academy movie. So that makes sense why David <laughs> Graff sense. is in the movie. <clears throat> he has such a, like, n- nothing part. I mean, he, like, barely even speaks in the movie. But he's such a huge part of those Police Academy movies. It's where I'll always think of him from. Mm-hmm. Um, he sadly passed really early. He was only 50. Um, right. So he didn't get to be in Police Academy 8. No oh, man, <laughs> I, so they really got good. There's like seven of them, uh, with most of the original cast. Uh, at, at some point, um, what's his face dropped out? Uh, Gutenberg, Guggenheim, Gutenberg, Guggenheim, Guggenheim. Gu- <laughs> Gutenberg, yeah, I don't remember Gutenberg. His name. He dropped Gu- out. I think um, or, uh, Bobcat Goldthwait did a few of them, and mm-hmm. then he dropped out. And the guy who makes the noises, uh, Michael Winslow. I think he's still in all of them. And then they did a TV <laughs> show, and David Graff was also in that. So he kind of milked that till till he passed. 
Um, Hugh Wilson also directed First Wives Club, um, Blast <laughs> from the Past, if you remember that movie with uh, Silverstone, yeah. Brendan Fraser and Christopher Walken. Yeah. Where, yeah. They've been living they underground. Grew up the whole in a time. nuclear bunker. Yeah. <laughs> or fallout wow. shelter. I haven't thought about that movie in ages. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. I remember renting that one. <laughs> yeah, me too. I don't want him to go out to the real world. <laughs> I want to watch that movie. He's the perfect man. <laughs> anyway, he uh, also wrote on the Bob Newhart show, which I can't remember if that's the. There was like the Bob Newhart show, and then there was the new Bob Newhart show. And uh, I think the new Bob Newhart show was the. This is my brother Daryl. This is my other brother Daryl. Mm. That one. I don't know if you guys remember that. I watched a lot of Nick at Night as a kid, so I watched all <laughs> of these old TV shows, including uh, WNRP or WKRP in Cincinnati, which he also uh, was a director on and, and worked on a bunch. This uh, was also written by Hugh Wilson, um, but with Peter Torokeve. Torokeve. Peter Torokeve. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he was a Canadian actor, uh, but he has like a Russian name. Um, Canadian actor, writer, <clears throat> producer, um, who's probably best known for his work on SCTV. Um, which he was he was on uh, camera, but he was also behind the camera on that. Um, SCTV famously it's kind of like the SNL um, Canadian version uh, that competed back and forth, um, launched the careers of such stars as John Candy, Eugene Levy, Rick Moranis, Catherine O'Hara, Harold Ramis, Martin Short, and Dave Thomas, and among others. I mean – it's a crazy list of people, and it was wasn't on for guy? very long. No, yeah. Uh, Dave but that's Thomas, where, the Wendy's guy. No, Dave Thomas, the uh, uh, Doug and Bob McKenzie guy. Oh, true, yeah, true yeah. white north, or yeah, great true white, white north, north. great white north. north. That's right. Uh, that actually was on um, SCTV. That's where that no. sketch came from. I only <laughs> saw it in a Rush concert. <laughs> <laughs> they had a clip for it that's where i get all my pop culture references <laughs> so rush. intros to rush songs uh this was shot by brian j reynolds uh who has mostly worked in tv oddly uh, this is one of the few movies most of the movies that he's done have been made for tv movies which is kind of weird that um he jumped into films a few times but he's mostly in tv um also shot tekken Oddly, <laughs> randomly, <laughs> they were like, "Get the get the guarding test guy for Tekken." <laughs> he seems to have a real eye for action. <laughs> um, also shot on NYPD Blue, The Closer, Better Off Ted, and that new reboot of Nine Hundred Two One Zero. Edited by Sydney Levin, who um, also edited Mean Streets. He said, "She said, and larger than life." It's that movie where Bill Murray in, inherits an elephant. <laughs> Anybody remembers that movie? No. <laughs> he he no. like inherits uh, an elephant and <clears throat> then he ends up, it's kind of one of those movies where it's like, he's trying to get across country with this elephant and then he starts to love the elephant and then he decides to like. <laughs> it's so it falls into the same trope elephant. here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The elephant is the asshole in this one. <laughs> Actually, it's more like Bill Murray is the, the asshole, asshole in this one. <clears throat> That's so against type for him. I just watched uh, Quantum Mania and <laughs> it's such a like. Um, Bill Murray's part is is just kind of confusingly weird. I, don't know. I want to watch it, today. and it's very short. It's like <laughs> there was supposed to be more to it, hmm. but I think they cut it because of yeah, some well, stuff you know, stuff. allegedly, allegedly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, apparently that guy is no longer writing uh, and. Uh, Kang Dynasty, the writer of that movie, oh, <laughs> was attached to Kang Dynasty, and apparently he's not anymore. But they're blaming it on the writer's strike or something. 
Yeah. Right. I guess that's a good way to get rid of bad writers. Oh, mm-hmm. strike. Oh, no. <laughs> I guess we'll have to find somebody new when you guys stop Rather striking. than announce that your guy is going to be in it, hype it up because the upcoming movie, and that movie bombs, and then you're like, oh. <clears throat> uh, yeah. I think that movie well. bombs the worst out of anything since, like, Dark World. Eternals. Eternals. <laughs> the Eternals made Eternals money, I think. Turn a profit. Um, yeah. I mean, Quantumania turned a profit, but it was like very low yeah, when it, it comes to Marvel lot. movies. I think it was only yeah. like 275 or 300 million, something like that, which is a crazy amount of money. But, you know, those movies cost like $150 million. So, you know, <laughs> huh. it's a pretty big gamble. I mean, at this yeah. point, <clears throat> it's not so much of a gamble thinking that these movies are going to do well, but like spending that much money. Each time out, it only takes one, and you're just, yeah, you're in the red horribly. Anyways, uh, music by Michael Convertino, who also did the music for Bull Durham, uh, The Santa Claus, and Things to Do in Denver When You're Dead. <laughs> always loved the name of that movie. <laughs> That's an odd collection of movies. Yeah, it's a weird, uh, weird mishmash. Bull Durham, okay, Santa Claus, sort of, go together. Things mm-hmm. to do in Denver when you're dead. Rotten Tomatoes gave this film a 56%. 5.7 out of 10. Only 34 reviews. Again, you got to remember, uh, Rotten Tomatoes didn't exist when this film came out, so they're going back to past uh, reviews and extrapolating what they think that the reviewers gave it out of 10. Um, so out of those 34 reviews, 56% of them gave it a 6 or better. Feels, feels about right. Um, audience score was 48%. Right there, kind of 5 out of 10. Uh, Metacritic's about the same, 46%. Uh, IMDb is a 6.2 out of 10. So uh, as we've said many times, that's kind of the, the real audience, the real people, and uh, a much bigger sample size on IMDb. So 6.2 out of 10. Uh, I feel like there's a lot of nostalgia around this film, like uh, if you grew up and it was on a lot. And this was weirdly uh, a lot of people's introduction to Cage. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. um, it was a popular movie. I remember it got run into the ground there for a while. And like, you know, it was on all the movie channels and then it was on like TNT, TBS all the time. Stuff like that. And it did get a cinema score. That's the first movie in a while that's gotten a cinema score. B+. Plus. Hey. A B plus, B plus, pretty tepid. Oof. Yeah, uh, when it comes to these films, uh, as we've mentioned in the past, you know, anything lower than like an A minus, you know, because people go- went specifically to watch the movie and then they were asked what their feelings were on the movie, and if you walk out of the theater with a B plus, that's not not the greatest endorsement for the film. How about a Coppola quick facts? Coppola quick facts. I only have a few things here, but um, George Clooney actually auditioned. For this film, um, and he had he auditioned for a role that only had one line, and it never made it to the screen. So, <laughs> uh, I don't know if that means that he was cast and they filmed it, or he just auditioned for you know, maybe David Graff's role or something. I don't know, or yeah, that guy who like got her a baby Ruth at the gas station. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think he could have played Doug. Yeah, he could play. He, he would. He would have been job. great. I, this was before he. Uh, this was like his ER days. Yeah, before his mm-hmm. ER days. Before he became what he became. You know, he was. Mm-hmm. He was really. If you go back to that era, he was in a lot of things, but he was just in very small parts until mm-hmm. ER launched him into stardom. Now it's just crazy to think that George Clooney wouldn't get cast in things, but back then, mm-hmm. yeah, he was kind of uh, on the older side when he got. Uh, ER, I think he was in his 40s. So Mm -hmm. his whole career has come post, what, 1997 or whatever? 94. 94. Well, that was when ER started. So that's when his his break. I don't know. I can't remember when he left the show. It was probably like 97, 98. I feel like his first like big movie role was um, maybe Dust Till Dawn. That was like the first time he really starred in a movie. Mm. Um, which was a pretty big movie to start out with, you know, Robert Rodriguez and Tarantino being at the height of their power yeah. at that point. Yeah, so that was ninety six, so a couple of years after ER started. That was yeah. probably I think he, he left, did probably both left for the show a bit. after that. Yeah. 
He's kind of he Damon Wayne's it for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Probably trying to ask him too much, and then they. Oh uh, yes, the best comparison. They parted ways. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Damon Wayne's. He, he rose to prominence just like. <laughs> Just, Just like, Clooney. like George Clinton, <laughs> <laughs> both household names. <laughs> uh, uh, principal photography began on uh, the seventeenth of February, nineteen ninety three, in a Baltimore neighborhood. Um, this entire film is actually shot in uh, Maryland, Baltimore area. That uh, Baltimore uh, neighborhood stood in for Tess Carlisle's hometown of Summersville. Which, for some reason in the movie, is spelled wrong. Because <laughs> it's S-O-M-E-R-S mm-hmm. Ville um, in real life, uh, which is about 45 minutes outside of Columbus. It's a real place. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe they just wanted to fictionalize it a little bit. Yeah, probably. Um, not really sure why that choice was made. but I think there's also there's legal issues sometimes with using... Real cities, depending on what they, you know, you have to, there's local entities that will require money to use Mm -hmm. the name or landmarks and stuff. And it varies from city to city and country to country. So I think it's easier to just sidestep it and just make a fake town and have not to deal with that shit. Yeah. This one is so like close though. (laughs) That's the weird thing. It's like S-O-M-E-R versus summer. This was actually the the house is actually located in the historic Mount Washington section of Baltimore, in Maryland. Um, which it does, I don't know. I, it does feel like Ohio, and it feels like Maryland at the same time. It's weird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Cage has said of his character, secret agent, <laughs> secret service special agent in charge, whatever his, his full title is, uh, Doug Chesnick. Doug is straightforward, very focused, very direct, but he is also one of those guys who joined the Secret Service because he likes the adrenaline rush that comes from a high-action job. The problem is, in the service of Mrs. Carlyle, he's basically a waiter or a butler. So that kind of informed his whole performance throughout this movie. Adrenaline junkie who's basically just a waiter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we want to be down I mean, you there! Go, you go from the President's Secret Service detail to... yeah. The wife of the former yeah. president. Guarding some old lady. Out in some homestead. In Ohio. <laughs> yeah, in the middle of nowhere. Oh, wow. Yeah. <clears throat> That's the biggest offense. <laughs> I just feel like they picked the most boring place they could think of. Yeah. Yeah, it stuck him in the middle of Ohio. That's about as far from the White House as you can get. Mm-hmm. And then the f- final quick fact here is uh, I love this. I, I always love these little tidbits about how – Cage got along with his co-stars and stuff. <clears throat> Stars Shirley MacLaine and Nicolas Cage became great friends while filming due to their mutual love of animals. We've talked about this many times in the past, but <laughs> Cage has got snakes and crows and Dragons. flying squirrels and all sorts of shit. <laughs> that he Chameleons. Has care of. Yeah, he's got all <laughs> sorts of stuff. He's got iguanas that he <laughs> keeps on his coffee table. Gives him a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> Chameleons, he gives cigarettes, yeah. <laughs> I bet he really hated filming that scene just because of that. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, they went on to co-adopt many animals together. Including a ferret named Whiskers and a zebra <laughs> named Mr. Zed, which is funny because they talk about Mr. Ed in this film. Oh, man. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> that's, 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 that's hilarious. Yeah, it's, it's funny. Both of them seem like really cool people. Uh, yeah. Shirley MacLaine mm-hmm. is, seems awesome in real life. <laughs> I just love that. I just love the idea. You want to co-adopt a ferret with me? <laughs> Do they share custody of it? <laughs> Probably go back and forth. I don't know. Maybe because they both. Well, I don't know. Uh, at the time, ninety four. I think Cage was still living in Los Angeles, so maybe they were both in L A. It's probably like something where it's like they co-adopted to pay for an animal that it lives mm-hmm. inside of an animal sanctuary mm-hmm. or a zoo or something. But it's still <laughs> awesome just to think that Shirley <laughs> MacLaine and Nicolas Cage bought a zebra together. <laughs> uh, that's great. <laughs> All right, it's time to break down the film one scene at a time. Act one, 
why don't we set some shit up? Our story begins at a stately manor in Summersville, Ohio. Nick's character, Doug Chesnick, pulls up in the height of 1990s elegance and design, a gorgeous, brand newish Chrysler LeBaron <laughs> sedan. Oh, those cars were everywhere in the yeah. 90s. It's such an ugly car. <laughs> They're awful. <laughs> Uh, it fits his character so well, though. Yeah. Inside, he makes his way upstairs holding a food tray with a big smile on his face. Before entering the room, he removes a pistol from his belt, knocks on the door, and announces he's there to say goodbye since he's going. I'm going. <laughs> uh, after he receives no answer, he leaves the food tray on a nearby table, takes his gun, and makes his way to the home's kitchen. He excitedly tells a group of staff members goodbye, and next we see him smiling his ass off while drinking a Bloody Mary on a plane. We cut to a long aerial shot of the Potomac River in Washington, D.C., while the score goes absolutely <laughs> apeshit for some reason. <laughs> just <laughs> raise the flutes and everything's just going nuts. Yeah, it does that quite a bit in this movie. It's whimsical. Mm -hmm. It's very whimsical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. It reminded me of Trapped in Paradise. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was the same thing, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> we see Doug enter FBI headquarters where he tries to warn someone that a man named Ian Howe is planning to steal the <laughs> Declaration of Independence. <laughs> I swear it's the same building. <laughs> it probably is. It's, I think it's like the Secret Service <clears throat> building that he yeah, goes into. Yeah, it's like but, their headquarters. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go to DC and you walk around that area where the FBI headquarters are, they like there's like 20 buildings that look exactly the same that are all headquarters of different mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> Secret Service, the IRS, FBI. They're all like right next to each other. Doug meets the director of the Secret Service who congratulates him on doing a great job on a tough assignment guarding the former First Lady of the United States, Mrs. Tess Carlisle. He says he's hoping for a more active assignment, potentially back in the White House or in New York or L.A., anything not involving copious amounts of old lady farts, really. <laughs> <laughs> Dad, can you come in here? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god what's that smell <laughs> Jesus been eating baby Ruth's again <laughs> <laughs> the director asks how the first lady is doing and Doug says she's a rotten old bitch <laughs> no wait he says she's adored publicly but difficult in private if you don't know how to handle her and he knows how to handle her obviously so we see coming up Doug says he doesn't envy the poor bastard who has to replace him, but goes on to say when he served for the former president, Mrs. Carlisle was a much nicer person to be around. But now she's like being around a schizophrenic or something to that effect. So she's got like multiple personalities. Yeah, she's got like seven personalities. <laughs> I feel like she's kind of like bipolar. Or I feel like it's the brain tumor mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and depression. <laughs> Yeah. You think maybe she can uh, move things alcoholism. with her mind? Like, oh, that would have been an <laughs> awesome twist. <laughs> that seems to the be a movie. movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the director drops the bomb that Tess called the White House the night before and asked the president himself to arrange for Doug to stay on for another tour, which I guess are three years at a time into the assignments. Doug is mortified having thought he'd finally escaped this shitty assignment, only to find out he has to go right back to it. He says he can't do three more years or even three more minutes guarding tests since it's the worst <laughs> assignment in the Secret Service. <laughs> it's some, I, know, love it's that. Like, I love that switch. Yeah. He's all diplomatic and speaking pretty <laughs> mm -hmm. highly about her, and then as soon as he finds out he's going back. Yeah. I can't do this again. It's the worst <laughs> thing ever. Gonna fucking smother her with a pillow. <laughs> Going to kill her. Uh, yeah, it's kind of this, that way. He's like very like put together and uh, <laughs> very like focused and and very diplomatic. And then he's not like he has his moments where he snaps and then he goes completely off the rails. 
I guess this, this, this is the early sign of that switch. Yeah. <laughs> the director says the president has asked for Doug to return to Mrs. Carlisle as a personal favor. And after a moment of contemplation as to whether he wants to say no to the president of the United States, we see him return to bumfuck <laughs> Ohio. <laughs> Could be worse, I guess. At least he doesn't live in uh, East Palestine. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole nother can of worms out there. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <sighs> Doug pops back into the house filled with Secret Service agents, cooks, a chauffeur named Earl, <laughs> etc. cetera. Uh, this is our first. Uh, we see each time that Earl is on camera, he kind of does something that irks Doug in some way. Yeah. Which, uh, yeah, spoilers for later. <laughs> He pops in like he never left, and they're all surprised to see him. That guy who kept Harry Potter trapped in a closet under the stairs <laughs> asks Doug if he's back to pick up his accoutrement. <laughs> and Doug tells him to speak English, so he says, just back to pick up your shit. <laughs> a little too in like an American accent. <laughs> you guys, it's just the comic relief yeah. throughout. Yeah. Which works sometimes, some of the time. <laughs> Doug yells at the chauffeur, Earl, not to smoke in the house, and he complains, uh, Earl complains that he should be able to since Tess never comes downstairs. <laughs> at this point, I think we're supposed to picture Tess as if she's like Howard Hughes hiding away, collecting her urine in mason jars or something. Because <laughs> they really paint her as just this hermit who never leaves that room. <clears throat> <clears throat> Fred, Harry Potter's uncle, Nicely decorates a food tray with a rose, but Doug rips the rose in half and pops the flower into his suit jacket, that little lapel thing, much to Fred and the chef's terror. Uh, obviously, this is like a daily ritual that's been going on for a very long time. Doug just ripped the rose in half. <laughs> Doug takes the food dish upstairs where he is greeted by Kimberly, Mrs. Carlisle's weird aspie secretary. <laughs> <laughs> who is also shocked to see Doug back. She's almost just weird for the sake of being weird. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it was to show that like Mrs. Carlisle is actually a good person and she hires these local people who may or may not be uh, yeah. the right choice for the job, which right. her judgment on one of them is pretty terrible. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, it seems like uh at first, when you first meet her, she's sort of like browbeaten. It seems like she's she's browbeaten and silent because of how strong of a personality Tess is. But then mm. later on, you find out it's just that's just who she is. And Tess hired her anyway. Doug takes his gun off and knocks on the door. But once again, he gets no answer. So he angrily yells, breakfast. <laughs> <clears throat> you can tell he's making just, my he's breakfast. Just, <laughs> <laughs> he's breakfast. just fucking over it at this point. <laughs> you doing down here i came my lunch <laughs> <laughs> we hear tess say come in after doug gets frustrated and doug enters to see oscar winner shirley mclean aggressively filling a mason jar with pee while repeating come in with the milk come in with the milk come in with the milk <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, she's, she's perfectly well camped and is oh clipping articles God. out of the newspaper. <laughs> Anybody see the aviator? <laughs> Come in with the milk. She pays Doug no mind until he drops some of her books she had on her bed on the floor and he leaves the food tray in the, in the book's place. <laughs> she picks them up and just drops them. He begins to walk out, but she stops him by saying, you seem to have dropped some of my things on the floor. <laughs> He begrudgingly picks up the books while she calls him a good boy, which obviously pisses him off. She asks if people still remember she even exists in D.C., and Doug asks her why the hell she forced him to come back. She says, because I like you, Douglas, and is sad that he'd ever want to leave her behind since she's such a treat to be around. He frustratedly tells her he wants to get back to his life in Washington, but she calls it a dead-end town for his career and that she needs him there. I think really she just, spoilers for later, she just didn't want anybody new coming in while she's dying. You know, mm -hmm. <clears throat> Probably doesn't have much time left. I don't really know what the, uh, 
the timeline, the overall timeline of this is, it feels like three or four months maybe. Because it's winter when it starts, but that's Ohio, so it could yeah. be yeah. as early as like <laughs> September, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we see Christmas go by and then some more time goes by and she's like freezing at the lake uh, before she gets kidnapped spoilers um so i don't know like three or four months yeah i figured yeah, it was that's what i'd think yeah about four four months or so yeah i mean when they show spoilers the tumor in her head it's pretty large like she yeah doesn't have a lot of time left mm-hmm. yeah which really i guess uh if you go by when we see that tumor in her head um it's uh, she lets Doug back in like within a couple of days, him and his team back in. And then the kidnapping happens shortly after that. No, mm-hmm. uh, no. Cause she, well, she goes to the, the presidential library and <clears throat> anyways, we're, we're getting way ahead of ourselves. Yeah, but the timeline of this movie doesn't really matter. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Um, anyways. <laughs> he tells her he came back of his own free will, which she calls bullshit. <laughs> he says he's an S A I C so it's his right to refuse any assignment, and she condescendingly asks what the hell a sake is, <laughs> to which he says special agent in charge. This causes her to get all sorts of asshole and says Doug is only in charge because she forced him to come back, and he has absolutely no free will of his own. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of true. He mm-hmm. is kind of forced into this because the fucking president is asking yeah. him yeah. to come back personally. He looks at her like he wants to blow one of her toes off with a revolver at point blank (laughs) range for a second before she says she has exciting news for him. She tells him she has an inoperable brain tumor, but he thinks she's just messing with him. She also says she bought he and his men a Scud missile launcher and she wants to go to the opera, then says... Which one of those do you think is true? So, you know, <laughs> can't imagine why he doesn't actually think that she has a brain tumor. I feel like she does this a lot, just kind yeah. of screwing with him. But Oops. he he does seem to uh, react as if he knew something was up um, mm-hmm. when it's, like, revealed officially later on. Yeah. Uh, Which is asked, funny because now we learn kind of like she didn't really want to go to the opera. So she was telling the truth. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> she falls asleep during it. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, it's funny because she makes such a big deal about it being, you know, such highbrow sophistication, um, which coming yeah. up here. Um, but then she falls asleep during yeah. it. <laughs> so even she's just kind of bored of it. The mm-hmm. only person who seems to really enjoy it is uh, Uncle Dursley. Fred. Yeah. Uncle Dursley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he asks when she wants to go to the opera, and she says she wants to go to Columbus a week from Friday. He tells her it's nice to see her getting out again, and she says, that's very patronizing of you. <laughs> <laughs> then she makes fun of him for not liking the opera, and that he'd probably rather watch reruns of Mr. Ed, to which she says, i choose Mr. Ed in a second. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both, Doug. <laughs> oh i also watched a lot of mr ed growing up man. i was on nick at night like every single of night of course <laughs> it was like yeah i don't know if it was just i didn't want to change the channel but like from like five o'clock <laughs> until like 10 or 11 it was just wall to wall like i love lucy yeah. and bob newhart i hated it mary I never tyler watched Moore, all shit. those things i watched every one of those shows <laughs> A ton. It's like, where's my all that? The fuck this? Yeah. Where's, yeah, where's hey my dude? All that? <laughs> Nobody's getting sure. slimed in this. I want to watch the Amanda <laughs> Bynes show. <laughs> yeah. Where's Kenny and Kel? Then she calls him Agent Dougie and tells him to put the rose he took off of her tray back where it belongs. And he storms out after angrily removing the rose from his rappel- lapel. Doug enters a nearby building that seems to serve as the former First Lady's Secret Service base of operation, and he's alerted that Mrs. Carlisle wants him to come back. (laughs) (laughs) To which he says, oh, come on, I was just up there. Just fucking with him nonstop here. Gotta establish that she's the antagonist, really. Mm -hmm. 
he bitches about having to come back and that she doesn't actually like him and how he's only there because she doesn't want someone new coming in and shaking things up. They're interrupted by a news report of Secret Service agents saving the current president from an assassination attempt, and Doug laments for the job he feels he should be doing rather than playing errand boy for a crotchety old lady. While all this is going on, Tess keeps calling on the phone for him to come to her, and he says he'll be there in 15 minutes. When everyone in the room implores him to go to her immediately, he says, What is she want? Chocolate? Some kind of goddamn food drink or something? What do we look like? Waiters? Are we a bunch of waiters? We want to be down there! (laughs) He's pointing to the the Secret Service agents saving the president. Uh. Such an amazing, (laughs) cagey delivery. Yeah. He has a few of those. (laughs) Kiss-esque. It's just, it's like ridiculous. I don't, it's like almost like he's like channeling a military thing, but at the same time, he's like losing yeah. his composure. Mm-hmm. Suddenly, an alarm goes off, and one of the other Secret Service guys runs to Mrs. Carlisle while Doug slumps against the locker and says, I can't do three more years of this. <laughs> when the Secret Service guy busts into Tess's room with a gun to see what the emergency is, she freaks out and says she told him never to bring a gun into the room and orders him out. I'm guessing that this happens all the time, so I don't know why he was so gung-ho to run in there. Uh, maybe he's one of the new guys. We see uh, if you watch the staff, everybody like slowly changes in and out. Like uh, mm-hmm. Barack Obama lookalike <laughs> guy shows up <laughs> later on. Thank and- God you call that out. Cause <laughs> <laughs> that's the first thing I thought when I saw him. It's like, hey, yeah. it's a young Brock. And then like the guy, uh, Ralph, wasn't there earlier. So I think they just keep switching <clears throat> out the Secret Service guys. Though David Graff, I think, stays for most of the film. Mm-hmm. Not sure if he's yeah he's, he's in the there. final. He's there the whole time. Scene. Yeah, yeah. Um, Doug arrives and scolds her for using the alarm since it's for emergencies. So she says she'll use it anytime she feels fit. <laughs> he asks her what the hell she wants, and she says to play golf. <laughs> so yeah, she's definitely a politician. <laughs> <laughs> she tells them to have the car ready in half an hour, and Doug patiently agrees. It's just, you know, uh, they, uh, Tess herself calls it out later on, but just think about how much money is spent for these jackasses to run around town golfing and all this kind of stuff. And like, who is who, I mean, it happens in the movie spoilers, but like who is planning to kidnap or do anything to some old lady that used to be like the president's wife, you know, I think this was supposed to be based on like. Uh, Jackie O a little bit but you know just kind of her having a secret service staff around her and she I think she actually dismissed them when she remarried Mm. she didn't want secret service around her anymore Mm -hmm. she had absolutely no privacy just like Tess yeah Uh, though she kind of plays more of a Nancy Reagan I feel like yeah (laughs) yeah she'd beat the shit out of Nancy Reagan yeah (laughs) yeah she would she goes toe to toe which I would love to see <laughs> uh, just anybody beating up Nancy Reagan would be. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Tess and her secretary play golf in the freezing Ohio cold while Doug and like five other Secret Service agents keep watch. Uh, Tess bitches at an agent for standing behind her, then scolds him for interrupting her swing and like, because he, he keeps going on about how he was it. Because she's like, didn't you serve for. Nixon or Agnew or one of those guys. And he's like, I was too young. <laughs> like while she's in the middle of her backswing. <laughs> like that. Then she gets pissed at him. Like, <laughs> get out of Fucking here. kids. Get the days. cart. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you've experienced that at work, but somebody says something like that. Oh, I was too young for that. And you feel yeah. really mm-hmm. fucking old. Like it there's a guy the other day old. who was like, I've never even heard of Frazier. Yeah. It's like I you never thing. heard of it. I've never even <laughs> heard that it exists. And he's okay. like, no. And we're like, <laughs> it was funny because my manager was—he's the same age as me, but he loved Frazier. He was like, it won thirty-seven Emmys. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say, uh, 
there's been a lot of that lately in my life. Uh, I'm getting <laughs> a little older, I guess, uh, but it's it's becoming more and more prevalent, like yeah. music, movies, and stuff. And mm-hmm. one that really struck me odd was um, we were in San Francisco, and like uh, somebody wanted to go see the cable cars, and they're like, "It just reminds me of that commercial, you know, the rice aroni. It's a you mm. know, San Francisco treat." And everyone in the office that was under the age of 30 had no idea what the hell that was. And I was like, okay. that was the most popular commercial on TV for like 20 years. Every day of my yeah. childhood, I heard that freaking jingle and nobody knows what it is anymore. It's crazy. Anyways, just three old men talking about <laughs> Edward. Better times. I really connected with Tess in that moment yeah. for that for that reason. <laughs> but I'm not even half her age. Yep. <clears throat> it's just going to get worse. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty soon they'll be like, what was the MCU? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> yeah, it's going to happen to all of you, by the way. It's not just us. It's going to happen yeah. to all of you. Name a thing you like, and ten yeah. years from now, some kid People, will be like, "They won't what know the what fuck TikTok is." That? is. Yeah, yeah, for real, for real. And God, it's gonna happen to all yeah. you kids out there. <laughs> yeah, no cap. <laughs> <laughs> Eugene <bustle>. Tackleberry <laughs> asked Doug why, after five years of Mrs. Carlyle <laughs> sitting in a room, she would suddenly want to go play golf, and Tess tells them all to shut up. <laughs> Synchronized swimming. That's what's coming next. Tess shanks a ball into the woods and tells Doug to be a good boy and go get it. <laughs> he puts his foot down by saying, I'm a Secret Service agent, Mrs. Carlisle, not a caddy. You want that ball? I suggest you go get it yourself. <laughs> he goes on to say he intends to do his job by the book from now on since he's been forced to come back and that he won't be doing any more errands, snack runs, and that he won't be checking his gun at the door anymore. He tells her if she doesn't like it to call Washington and get a new Doug while she stares daggers at him. Later that night, he uh, confidently recounts the story to his fellow agents about telling her off at some diner, but is interrupted by a call from the president himself (laughs) who tells an (laughs) exasperated Doug that he received a call from Tess Carlisle saying Doug tore up her flowers. (laughs) Feel like a goddamn idiot. (laughs) <laughs> That's his go-to thing, the president. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he scolds Doug, saying he needs to get along with Mrs. Carlisle since her husband was the president when he was vice president. Um, that Tess also championed his nomination, and he owes her a lot of debt. He says if he gets any more phone calls from Mrs. Carlisle, he'll have Doug guarding his dog. And goes on to say he feels like a goddamn idiot having to call Doug about a goddamn flower. <laughs> I, I really love the the president's calls because they're like they're always like very cordial and nice but then he gets like a moment where he goes off the deep end and starts screaming at him and you can tell Doug is just like oh, okay okay Mr. President <laughs> yeah they're great <clears throat> yeah and he's always shocked to get the call Doug returns to his men with his tail between his legs and looks like he's on the verge of crying <laughs> Uh, Tess gets ready for the opera while Uncle Dursley does a dance to some opera downstairs <laughs> for the wait staff. <laughs> it was this or the goodbye horses tuck dance from Silence of the Lambs, so I'm sure they're happy. <laughs> uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, see, I don't want to see that actually no. <laughs> <laughs> the, the secret service agents prep Uzis and all sorts of crazy shit To take the former first lady To an opera in Columbus, Ohio <laughs> But I guess given events we see later Maybe they weren't wrong to be overly cautious <laughs> I really want to see <laughs> Uncle Dursley doing the goodbye <laughs> horses stance <laughs> Uh, what do you fuck me Harry I'd fuck me I'd fuck me so hard I'd fuck me hard (laughs) was I a great big fat person (laughs) he's 
Does, was she a great big fat? But he's a great big fat person. You know? They did him dirty by making him wear white the entire fucking movie. Yeah, it, it did not I think hide he's supposed anything. to be like her nurse. I think that's what's going yeah. on there. Yeah, I think he's her nurse. Yeah, but he never interacts with her. Like he never he goes, goes to up opera. to her room and helps out with her. No, he has um, the opera with them. But I'm pretty positive he's the nurse. That's why he's wearing yeah. white the entire yeah. time. Yes. I wonder that too. But yeah, he is. He's her. They got the most unhealthy guy in Hollywood <laughs> to be her nurse. Yeah. <laughs> I like when she checks out happy later on, she tells him to do some sit-ups. Yeah. <laughs> Red, maybe some sit-ups. <laughs> and he's like, would you fuck me? <laughs> fuck me hard. <laughs> <laughs> Outside, Doug opens the door for Tess, but she wants to get in the driver's side. But uh, Eugene Tackleberry, I don't I don't think he has a character name. I don't remember ever hearing it. I just call him Tackleberry throughout the I whole thing. I can't time. remember. The only thing I've ever seen him in. Uh, he refuses to open the door for her since it's procedure to have her sit on the passenger side of the car, which I was confused about because, like, Doug says he needs to be able to see the driver and her at the same time. But wouldn't it make more sense for her to be on the other side for him to see both of them at the same time? Yeah, he should. Yeah. 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 But I think because he can always turn around and look and the driver can't safely do that. So if she's sitting directly behind the driver, the driver can't see her as easily gotcha. as a passenger. But the driver is not part of her security detail. He's just a chauffeur. Yeah. He's yeah not part but of it could also service. just be he could see if she's taking her seatbelt off or doing anything else that's unsafe. I don't know. Mm. But it makes sense to me. Maybe it's okay. a JFK thing. <laughs> God damn it. I don't, I don't remember where he was sitting. He was sat. He was sat behind, behind the, uh, the, passenger. the passenger, yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Which that guy also got hit by the mm-hmm. way. Uh, by the phantom bullet that went up and down. Mm-hmm. The magic bullet. Yeah. All right, calm magic down, bullet. Alderstone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she's pissed to have no personal freedom nor say even in where she sits in the car. She angrily gets in the car, but then quickly shifts to the other side back behind the driver. Doug tells the driver Earl to kill the engine until she sits where she's supposed to, (laughs) but she orders her driver to start the car. If he wants to keep his job comes into play later on. Doug explains that she's not allowed to sit behind the driver in case of emergency. And she again refuses since she doesn't want the sun to be on her face. Uh, Like I said, this drive from Somersville to Columbus is only like 45 minutes. So, yeah, you know, she hasn't been out of the house in weeks, apparently, so maybe this is a big deal. I don't know. I think you would want some sun on your face. Yeah. Doug gets increasingly more frustrated, saying they're not leaving until she's on the proper side of the car, which is behind him. Um, things get real awkward, and after a really long beat, she tearfully relents and moves to the other side of the car. She got a feel for her in that moment. It was like, you know... <laughs> she just yeah. wants to sit where she wants yeah. to sit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Instead she gets treated like a child. Mm-hmm. And she, you know, she's such a like powerful, prominent, you know, figure in politics, but she can't do anything. You know, basically can't even go to the bathroom without mm. having to alert the freaking secret service about it. So I get it. I get why she's so, uh, confrontational with these guys. <laughs> At the opera, Mrs. Carlyle sits in a private box while Doug watches nearby with Cher. No, wait, no, wait. That's <laughs> <laughs> Doug's God, right, but right behind her, keeping watch. <laughs> it did remind me of that scene from mm-hmm. Moonstruck. Are they watching La Bohème? Yeah, La Bohème. Tess fights falling asleep, and eventually she slumps in her chair while the crowd kind of starts to notice that <laughs> she's fallen asleep. Uh, To help avoid embarrassment, Doug attempts to pull her chair out of view, but she is startled awake, shrieks, and drops her playbill off the balcony, which causes the whole audience to take notice. (laughs) She's understandably horribly embarrassed, as is Doug, and she tells him she wants to go home and that she'll never return to Columbus again. Not a big deal. Yeah. Or she can go watch an Ohio State football game. <laughs> <laughs> but go Buckeyes. 
Uh, on the way out, however, she's greeted by a crowd of people who applaud at her mere presence, and she turns on the charm. She smiles and shakes hands, then thanks them all for being so sweet, while the Secret Service agents try to stop some old lady from sneaking up with a shiv or a pen for an autograph. Uh, that was, you know, their biggest test they'd had in a long time. <laughs> yeah. Just walking through no, I this mean, Last time Cage was people. in an opera house, some guy tried to kill him and then he had to shoot him in self-defense <laughs> or stab him in self-defense. Yeah, stab him and beat him to death. <laughs> Uh, Tess has a change of heart and says she wants to stay in Columbus now since she's obviously since she obviously craves the uh, limelight that she once had but doesn't have anymore. Um, yeah, we get that a few times throughout this movie. Of, like she really enjoys, you know, having people dote over her and and, and adore her, even though she's a contemptuous bitch. <laughs> At the hotel, a fellow agent asks Doug why he doesn't just let Tess do whatever the hell she wants, since there's little to no chance she'll ever actually be in danger. Which is, you know, kind of true, but also, as we see, not. He says he's going to do his job right and with pride or not at all. The agent tells Doug this is a cupcake assignment and that he's... Let the job get too personal, and Doug seems to agree with that, at least at least a little. His uh, attitude changes a little bit from here. Mm-hmm. Um, outside Tess's room, Doug sees that she's been drinking and tells the guy guarding the room to get rid of the evidence. Inside the room, we see Tess drunk on mini bar bottles watching a parade float go by the window. No, wait. <laughs> <laughs> They're all blurring together. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Didn't God. she have a real rocky relationship with her husband? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he died of a heart attack in office. <laughs> Just weatherman. Here with the weather. <laughs> Act two. Let's get some motivation up in this thing. On the way back to Summersville, the detail stops for gas, and the two agents talk about how Miss Carlisle could beat the shit out of Nancy Reagan, which would be awesome to see. <laughs> Tess asks an agent named Ralph to get her a baby Ruth and she tells her driver Earl to gun it. <laughs> I was trying to think that she tells the driver Earl, hey you guys. <laughs> <laughs> baby <Shit>. <laughs> Ruth. <laughs> he tells her he can't, but again she threatens his job and he agrees, much to her delight. They peel out, leaving the Secret Service agents behind, and they take off after her leaving Harry Potter's uncle, a.k.a. the comic relief of the movie, a.k.a. Fred, in the men's room at the gas station. <laughs> By the way, if you look closely, there's a sign behind him that says Vernon's, which is coincidentally his name in Harry Potter. Yeah, I, I noticed <laughs> that on the rewatch. I was like, what? <laughs> wow, that's weird. Very, those, you know, just serendipity moments. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We cut to that guy who played a cop in every other film in the 90s, Noble Willingham, who puts Doug on speakerphone while the whole station giggles their asses off over their former first lady ditching the Secret Service. <laughs> this scene becomes way less funny when she gets buried in a hole later in the movie. Spoilers. <laughs> I just picture them all giggling again. <laughs> oh, later. wait. This, it's serious this time. Oh. Yeah. Later, we see a couple of police cruisers escort her and Earl home, and Doug loses it. He tells Tackleberry, I want you to go in there and tell Earl to meet me in the office. Okay? In another very cagey delivery. <laughs> when confronted, Earl tries to laugh it off since Tess ordered him to drive off, but Doug throws him against a locker and screams in his face, Who sent you, baby girl? Huh? <laughs> Who sent you? <laughs> now, wait, that's... Uh, it's another thing. Deadfall. <laughs> <laughs> he tells Earl he's fired while well, he says he has no choice but to do what Tess wants since the secret service agents come and go, but he lives there permanently. It's all he's got. He's just the driver. Yeah. In Mrs. So Carlisle's. So it's like the chef, the nurse, uh, and her secretary, secretary, and the chauffeur are her personal staff Yeah. that the secret service can't do anything about. Which seems like a big breach of security to have four randos that... Turns out it is. Yeah. 
In Mrs. Carlyle's room, Doug asks if she, she enjoyed herself, and she tells him not to take that tone with her. She says she just wanted one hour of privacy, and Doug tells her he, he fired Earl since he's done this twice now, which we find out why he's been doing it. Mm. Take her to the doctor so that nobody else knows. Yeah. Uh, he says he is a driver in the employ of the Secret Service. I can't do anything about the cook and the nurse. No, they work for you. But this guy works for us, and he's gone! So some some real cagey. cagey moments right here. <laughs> yeah. This act and, and for the rest of the movie. She says he's her chauffeur and he's staying. And Doug says he can't do his job effectively if she doesn't let him lead the detail. And she tells him he can leave anytime he pleases. With tears in his eyes, he says thank you, tells her goodbye, slams the door and leaves. She follows after him and says, if I promise to never run away again, will that do? He says what she did was crazy, and she tells him he should try doing something crazy like her once in a while and live a little, but he doubles down on his regulations. He argues that they are there to protect her, but she can refuse Secret Service protection anytime she pleases. He then crosses the line, and she says she gets off on ordering around seven men and no women agents and having them at her beck and call all day and night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is a little tad bit over the line. <laughs> you yeah. just want to order around a bunch of men and treat them like shit. I think it was in response to her, like telling him to get a date or has that happened yet? No. Uh, uh, she, it's in, she says it there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like, she's emasculated him a little bit. Mm-hmm. I, so, I get the feeling that Doug's life is pretty fucking drab yeah. and boring. He's, yeah. He's probably very similar to like McConaughey's character and, true detective <laughs> goes home to a mattress on the floor and one <laughs> mirror on the wall. <laughs> That's it. I mean, we see him in his house a couple of times and it's just <laughs> a big empty house. Just he yeah. lives in. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, kind of sad. I mean, his whole life is this job. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> As that happens a lot with uh, these types of positions. Yeah. Either I'm surprised that he doesn't or live there. Police and, yeah. It's just kind of weird that he lived off site to me. <laughs> Like, mm. as the head of her security detail, you'd think he'd just live there for convenience. Yeah. Be there at a moment's notice. Right. Mm-hmm. But I guess they have other agents for that at all times, so he doesn't yeah. have to be there. He's a supervisor. Shifts around the clock. Yep. Uh, she screams at him to get out, and he obliges. She tears up and grabs her head in pain. Pain. We see Doug on the toilet, where he gets a call from some guy named Santos. <laughs> No, he gets another <laughs> call from the president who again scolds him since Mrs. Carlisle has taken Doug's suggestion and decided to refuse Secret Service protection. Then the president calls Tess a national treasure ah! and that Doug needs to fix the situation immediately. <laughs> another browbeating dressing down from the president yeah. calling him from Air Force One. <laughs> God damn idiot. Well, he's on the shitter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, he pulls up at Mrs. Carlisle's house only to find all the agents outside the gates. Doug tries to get the chef to open the door, but he refuses. Then comic relief tells him he's holding Mrs. Carlisle hostage and that he wants a hundred dollars in unmarked bills, a helicopter matching sports coats and a copy of the movie Gigi. God, guess he's yeah. a big Jennifer Lopez fan. Oh, wait, that's a different movie. <laughs> it's Geely. <laughs> Earl greets Doug at the gate and Earl says Doug owes him an apology. Doug tells Earl to let him know if she plans to leave the house and Earl reluctantly agrees. Doug and the two other agents decide to keep watch outside the house in their cars on the street to make sure she's safe. Later, Doug follows Earl and Tess and she tells him to get lost. They follow behind anyway to an office building where Doug again tries to reason with her, but she tells him to get away from her. Inside the building, we see Tess wasn't lying about the whole inoperable brain tumor thing and that she's undergoing a CAT scan. <laughs> On a monitor, we see that she has a huge mass in her brain and the doctor shakes his head as if there's no hope left. Or he just saw the score to the Buckeyes game against Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> also no hope left. <laughs> Back at home, Tessa's secretary excitedly gives her a letter from her son, and we see her greet Barry, presumably days later, and she's over the moon to see him. He immediately launches into a sales pitch for a real estate investment, and she's gutted to find out the only reason he paid her a visit was to get her to endorse the project to help generate trust and interest from investors. She firmly tells him no, and he angrily storms out while Doug watches from a distance. I wasn't sure if that was supposed to be Doug watching, but it was like on a monitor. Mm-hmm. It was um, weird. But then 
the monitors are in the operation center, which is on the ground. So he wouldn't yeah. have been able to see that from there. No. I don't know. I think it, we were supposed to be getting like his POV, but it was shot mm-hmm. like it was like on a monitor. I don't know. Yeah, it was odd. Weird. <clears throat> Maybe he set up his own set of cameras to watch from the car. <laughs> That's creepy. We, we cut to Christmas time where Tess watches old news reports from her husband's presidency with magazines of her days as first lady strewn across the bed. In a news report, the announcer seemed to make it clear that Tess was the real brains behind the presidency. And she spots Doug in the background of the video smiling at her husband. We see another news report showing that her husband died of a heart attack in office, and during the footage from the funeral, she sees Doug cry at her husband's funeral and realizes how much Doug cared for him. Although I didn't take it to her realizing it. I think she always knew this, which is why she yeah. always had him work for her. She just, yeah, like, I think I so forget too. the feeling she does this a lot, this ritual of watching these old tapes and yeah. reliving the glory days, and so she always <clears> knew that. We kind of learned that she had always had a soft spot for Doug because of how he was friends with her husband and she knew him from that time. Yeah. So I kind of felt like that's where, why she always requested him and, and wanted him on her detail because in her opinion, DC is a dead end town for career wise. And it's probably yeah. not great for and a she, lot of other agents. She does love him. I think, yeah. um, so she's looking out for him, but she's just one of those types of people who just constantly is poking you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> just one of those, you know, personalities, <laughs> but I think, you know, Doug is kind of bored yeah. <laughs> of this whole thing. I mean, he was the head of secret service for the president and then had to transition to fucking middle of nowhere, Ohio <laughs> and guarding an old lady who probably mm-hmm. doesn't really need to be guarded. Well, I guess she does, but <laughs> as we see later. <laughs> yeah. Uh, She spots Doug outside her window in his car, drinking coffee to stay awake and heads outside to greet him. (laughs) I love this part. She knocks on his window and he pours hot coffee all over himself while screaming. (laughs) Oh, God! Ow! You scared me to death! (laughs) (laughs) After he freaks out about her sneaking up on him, she heads back to the house, but he stops her and tells her that he was wrong. Which, by the way, I'll just point out, spoilers, he was not wrong about anything. In fact, by relaxing his policies at this point in the film, he jeopardizes her life and basically ruins his own career and credibility forever. But anyway, she argues with him about how much money is wasted protecting political has-beens, and he tries to talk her into letting them come back to protect her. He asks why she came outside to talk to him in the first place if she wasn't going to ask for the detail to be reinstated, and she asks if he would like to have a cup of coffee. (laughs) That uh, that line was great, too. (laughs) I was going to ask if you wanted some coffee, but... (laughs) <laughs> or whatever she Obviously says. you have some. <laughs> it's all over his front spill over him. <laughs> Inside, she says coffee keeps her awake, so she'd actually like to have a drink instead. He pretends not to know she has a drink occasionally, and she says, if I located a bottle, would you join me for a highball? They have a few drinks and argue a bit more before he suddenly flips the table, picks her up, and says, son of a bitch! <laughs> Mrs. Carlisle asks, where are you taking me? And he says, to the bed. <laughs> now wait he agrees to have a drink with her and she talks about how she and her daughter barely speak her relationship with her real estate mogul ghoul looking son isn't much better and that she doesn't really blame them for being screwed up since they grew up in politics that guy was perfectly cast as a politician because he just looks like a ghoul (laughs) he's not even a politician he's a politician's useless son who just does real estate deals real estate (laughs) I think we were like, going for kind of a JFK Jr. Type yeah. Thing. yeah. <laughs> she asked if Doug knew how much her husband relied on her while they were in the White House, and he says it was pretty common knowledge. She then asks if he knew about her husband's affairs, and it's clear he knew, but he didn't think she did. She asks for his indiscretion, and he says, you can count on me, to which she says, I know I can. Then she says, Douglas, we're getting out of here. And the next thing you see is him telling her a story in a bar about a girl who told him, I won't suck you. Don't ask me to suck you. (laughs) Sorry. All these movies, they really just do seem to blur together at this point. (laughs) It was weird, though, when he's in the middle of a sentence and then he's like, wait, that guy, that guy's getting a handjob down there. (laughs) (laughs) The guy getting a handjob at the end of the bar there. 
Then there's a guy quacking at a guy. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> uh, oh, fuck. <laughs> So anyway, but they do head to some sort of a bar. What is it about drunks and wanting to go to someplace public to drink after having drinks at home? So do they enjoy paying five times the price and having to scream in a conversation over chameleon air blasting on the stereo? <laughs> <laughs> I've always wondered that about drinkers. I think it's just an excuse to go get social. Like it's more socially acceptable guess, yeah. to drink when you're out somewhere. Yeah. Then I mean, just funner drinking. when you're out, I guess. But it's like if you, you're just having a nightcap. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> go out instead. Yeah. Just go out. Which makes me wonder, like, what time is it? Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. he was, like, trying to stay awake drinking coffee. Made me think it was, like, after midnight or something. <clears throat> and then she comes out. They have yeah. a drink in the house, and then they go out to a bar. They go to a bar. <laughs> yeah. In Summersville, Ohio, I can't imagine there being many, like, 2 a.m. bars, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's just one of those, like, tropes. I guess script writers have to – two characters are having a drink. you got to be at a bar, I guess. <laughs> They're going to have some revealing aspects of their characters come out in conversation. Yeah. yeah. Just like hearing a news report on a TV <laughs> 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 to tell exposition. She asks about Doug's life, and he says he pretty much doesn't have one. She knows that he was once married for seven months, so she obviously did her research on Nicolas Cage. I mean, Doug. (laughs) (laughs) He tells her everyone seemed to know what his ex-wife was like except for him, and it's embarrassing for him to even talk about. She says she won't say anything again and calls him Secret Agent Douglas Chesnick, to which he corrects her by saying Special Secret Agent in Charge Douglas Chesnick, Assistant to the Regional Secret Agent. (laughs) Next, we see that Doug's detail has been allowed to return to the house and Tess's, which I just wonder, like, so what were they getting paid this whole time that they Mm -hmm. still watched her for an indeterminate amount of time? You'd feel like they have some other kind of supervisors to report to and some other assignment they would get sent to. Now, I get the sense that they were never actually dismissed uh, Mm. because the president called him and was like, fix this right now. Oh, that's Mm -hmm. right. And so they officially were still on the books to be guarding her. They just couldn't be on the property because she didn't want them there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Until she let him back in, which I think, you know, they were planning on waiting until she was back onto the property and all that kind of stuff. That's one of the nice things I like about toward the end of the movie. You can see they all actually really care about her. They're just trying to do their job and she just kind of makes it miserable, but they do still want to make sure she's safe and do their job. So, yeah. yeah, like the the scene in the gas station where they're talking about her boxing with Nancy Reagan. They're talking about how strong and and like resilient she is, and mm-hmm. you know they obviously respect her and genuinely like her. So. Yep. But anyway, we see that Doug's details been allowed to return to the house, and Tess's staff want to know how he did it, and he answers that the simple answer is she likes me. Tess strolls into the kitchen wearing a red dress, which I'm guessing is like when Ron Swanson wears his Tiger Woods shirt since Doug cured that brain tumor of hers by slamming her head on the headboard all night. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) (laughs) They're all shocked to see her downstairs and happy, but we quickly find out why. She tells Doug that the president is coming to Summersville for a visit and they're both super excited. Tess and the team all head to a presidential library in honor of her husband, and it's explained that the current president will be visiting to dedicate the final wing. She barely hides her excitement at the president paying a visit and suggests how the presentation should go down to the doofus who runs the library. And he doesn't seem that stoked that she's taking charge. (laughs) But Doug tells her he's excited to have his team tested and to put them back on their toes. And she says, so you think they're dull, too? (laughs) Tess completely comes out of her shell and seems to feel useful again thanks to this whole affair. She starts dressing better, goes through her long-neglected wardrobe, and even gets her hair did while Doug and his team are excited to be in charge of something bigger than grabbing Mrs. Carlisle a baby Ruth for a change. (laughs) 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 They go to the shooting range. Yeah. Get all the security detail. They're excited that the the president's secret service are going to be taking orders from them while they're on site. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a whole Uh, montage of... uh getting prepped Mm -hmm. on both sides from Tess and from Doug and his team. Uh, Tess goes shopping at a supermarket (laughs) and messes with the secret service guys by having them check the price of peas and forcing a Barack Obama lookalike to track down (laughs) someone who is smoking in the store. (laughs) (laughs) 
Unfortunately, after all that excitement, it turns out the president can't make it, but is instead sending the Secretary of Commerce in his place, and Doug is forced to deliver the bad news. He and Tess are both understandably devastated, but as in all cases in this film, they push on and do their jobs to the best of their ability, despite their constant disappointment. She gives a speech at the dedication and graciously introduces the random bureaucrat standing in for the president while Doug watches on proudly. Just kind of showing she was always that statesman. Yeah. You know, and she just needed to have the opportunity to do it again. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think she really misses that uh, feeling useful. Yeah. Well, they talk about she was basically like co running with her husband. So it was like yeah. she was the brains behind everything. And she's yeah. sort of just been relegated to a spinster living alone with nothing to do and no responsibilities and not an ounce of privacy at any point in her life. Yeah. I get, I get the sense that that's a common thing in presidencies is like the first lady actually has a hell of a lot more influence than a lot of people think, especially if they're, you know, smart. Not just a yeah. trophy wife that's just there for appearances, right? Not naming also, any names, but yeah. <laughs> but they also a lot of times, even if they are the brains, they just sort of have this public image of like they're only they're only good for being loved by the public and doing yeah. charity and stuff and outreach mm -hmm. and or like running something like um, <clears throat> uh, Barbara Bush was like the face of that like getting kids to read thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like some uh, philanthropic or charity organization stuff is all they're they're known for. But yeah, you know, in the case of Tess, it was like no, she she co led the country. She just nobody knows. I mean, I guess he said it was pretty well known, so people did actually know. But she wasn't publicly acknowledged for it. It seems like yeah, there was a news report where they said that she was like an honor student, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, had straight A's, and that her husband got like C's. He was yeah. A C's and they went to, they both went to the same college or whatever, but she was like the valedictorian or something. And he was just, <laughs> just barely graduated. <laughs> yeah. Act three. It's about time to wrap this thing up. All right. Everybody ready for this fun little comedy to take a gnarly dark turn, like possibly the <laughs> darkest turn you could take in a whole fucking comedy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> All right, well, then here we go. <laughs> we see snow on the ground, so we know it's been in a, another time jump. Every, everything in the house has gone back to being quiet and sterile since Tess has presumably gone back to hiding in her room and only almost Barack Obama wanders the house. It's weird that he only pops, like he first pops up in the store there and then he's there for the rest of the movie. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I just assume, like you said, they, they're in the middle of a rotation of agents everybody's Almost, three years is coming up i wonder about that from a filmmaking standpoint of like did they lose some actors along the way because i thought that they would want to like build up that relationship with these seven secret service agents but they keep changing them in and out so. true yeah doug is the only one who's like the permanent guy and what's his face tackleberry, tackleberry. yeah <laughs> tackleberry <laughs> Uh, Doug heads to Tess's room where she says she'd like to go to the lake the next day and that she'd very much appreciate it if she could go to the lake with him and no one else from the detail. He agrees and takes a look at what she's watching on TV before jokingly asking if what she's watching is better than Mr. Ed, playfully calling back to that argument they had earlier in the film. She's watching like the fucking Royals or some shit. <laughs> yeah, she was watching something at Buckingham Palace. Yeah, I was confused as to what that was. I, I'm assuming it was another like call back to her presidency. Like yeah, like it was, was a visit hmm. that the president made to Rockingham or something. Go see yeah. the queen. Uh, she flips off the TV without even looking at him and suddenly slumps in her chair while he leaves the room. We see her at the lake eating by herself before Doug interrupts her and says it's getting cold. She says, will you leave me alone, please? So he returns to the town car where we see that Earl, her chauffeur, has also come along. Time passes and we see her <laughs> asleep in her chair. Doug tries to wake her, but she doesn't move. So he checks her pulse and decides it's time for them to leave. So he carries her to the car. While heading to grab her chair, Earl once again guns it, leaving Doug behind. Oh, Mrs. Carlisle. She's such a kidder. <laughs> oh, wait, no. That's not what's happening this time. So hold on. So you mean we just saw an elderly woman with a brain tumor get kidnapped by one of her closest confidants? <laughs> I thought this was supposed to be a lighthearted comedy about a man cutting to the warm center of his insufferable bitch. <laughs> yeah it's both <laughs> it's, 
I liked it. I like this twist a lot. Doug hoofs it to a gas station where he calls Eugene Tackleberry, who says Mrs. Carlisle, Carlisle hasn't returned and neither has Earl. Hours pass and Doug decides it's time to let the brass in Washington know the situation, which Doug calls the worst moment of his life, which I really did feel for him and the team in that moment. Yeah. yeah. They, 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 I think they all did a good job of kind of portraying that, that defeated uh, energy mm-hmm. yeah. and look. Yeah, I mean, this is the worst possible <laughs> fuck up they could have had. I mean, yeah. and it's happened twice before already. Exactly, yeah, yeah. That night, Doug's team and a host of Secret Service guys mobilized in Ohio to track down the former First Lady. Which I also liked that the movie kind of set it up to where you could still, like, think maybe he was taking her to the hospital or something because mm-hmm. Earl cares about her and, like, he knows that she passed out and she's had health problems. So, like, maybe that's what's going on. You don't know as a viewer. And so mm-hmm. you're sort of like the rest of the team just having to sort of wait for her to come back and then admit defeat when she doesn't. Mm-hmm. and. You yeah, know, uh, call in the big guns and figure out something else is going on. Yeah. Well, the team from Washington make themselves right at home in the Carlisle Manor, and Doug tries to get them to adhere to test his rules, but they look at him like he's an idiot. Oh, uh, could you please put something down under that so you don't scratch the table? <laughs> I mean, you know, if and when she comes back, she's going to be pissed about that <laughs> stuff. So he's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're all confused as to how this team of agents couldn't take care of one little old lady. And Dale Dye pops into the movie just to say, You disgust me. <laughs> Which kind of feels a little bit harsh, but I, I get it. <laughs> I would have been like, I would have been like, yeah, what was oh. he? he was the head of the CIA. He's, yeah, right? he's head of the CIA. I'm like, good job with the bad pigs. <laughs> <laughs> or any other failed op <laughs> that you guys have fucking had. Jesus. <laughs> Judge me. <laughs> Dale Dye is, um, he's a treasure, man. <laughs> yeah. He was like an actual uh, military guy and he became like a consultant for films. I think Platoon was like when uh, he was first discovered and like they were like, you know, you speak so well that it feels like you should just play the role mm. the same thing happened with Arlie Emery mm-hmm. Emery yeah. in, um, in the full metal full metal jacket yeah <clears throat> and I think Dale Dye is also in that movie if I'm not mistaken but he mm. uh he has a, like a major role in um Band of Brothers that's where I yeah God, yeah that's where I, know him, I really know him from yeah every time I see him pop up in anything especially in older stuff I'm like oh shit that's Dale Dye <laughs> I think he's still around I think he's still still acting Doug gets a call from the sheriff who made fun of him earlier, and he alerts him that they found the car on a country road. Earl was found unconscious in the front seat, and Mrs. Carlisle was not at the scene, so they alert the president that Tess has been kidnapped. At the scene of the crime, Doug and his team aren't even allowed inside the police tape and have to stand there like a bunch of schmucks they are. Back at the Carlisle house, James Reborn, a.k.a. Agent Schaefer, pops into their surveillance command center tells the team that a syringe was found at the scene full of powerful sedatives and that the driver has burns on his neck, which they think is a brand of some sort of Middle East terrorist group. I, which, <laughs> I mean, why would they crescent, brand the guy and leave him alive? Crescent moon. Crescent you know? moon. Because <laughs> they have those crescent Muslims. swords. Pretty bad detective work by these yeah. guys. By the FBI, yeah. Well. Took Doug five seconds to figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> he also drops the bomb on them that Tess has been dying of a brain tumor this whole time, which none of them knew, and that a note was found in the glove box demanding fifteen million for her return. Well, it kind of feels a little steep for a former first lady, but maybe they'll just say call it call it a two you know call it two million after a few days like Eddie King and Arsenal. <laughs> it's called a cool two million. Yeah, maybe we'll Eddie Carson will set this whole thing up. <laughs> <laughs> turns out to be Eddie King. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Come on. Oh, Let me see Earl God. putting some visors in. <laughs> Schaefer tells them all to go home, and in the car, Doug watches as a fellow agent lights a cigarette with one of those car cigarette lighter things that none of us know about because we don't smoke. <laughs> And now we just plug in our USB chargers to those little ports. (laughs) Anyways, he realizes immediately what caused the burns on Earl's neck and speeds back to the house where he tells Schaefer his theory. They head to the hospital. If you grew up in the 80s, you definitely (laughs) recognize that thing. It's just crazy to think about, like... Smoking was so ubiquitous that every car came with cigarette lighters as a convenience. The same way that cars nowadays come with USB 
hookups for yeah. 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 And they yeah, still I mean, have the cigarette lighter, but it's not used for cigarettes no, anymore. No, it's just used for oh. power. <laughs> I mean, they have the cigarette lighter hole, but mm-hmm. there is no cigarette lighter in I know. it anymore. <laughs> I think you can still buy them. I think you can, yeah. Uh, when I was there. researching, I uh, typed in if they have – I was, like, checking to see if I could find, like, an official name for them, and I found them for sale, and you could buy them huh. on to, like, get free your car. So, yeah, still a thing. It's a blaster in the past right there. <clears throat> yeah. They're fancy now. <laughs> <laughs> they look all modern. Aftermarket. <laughs> <laughs> well, they head to the hospital where they ask to see the burns on Earl's neck. Doug stands over him like he's about to blow his toes off or something. It's a really weird look. And Earl gets increasingly <laughs> more uncomfortable as they question him. A nurse uncovers Earl's burns and Doug matches them up with a cigarette lighter from the back seat of Mrs. Carlisle's town car. Earl spots the cigarette lighter in Doug's hand and knows he's his goose is cooked. He thinks for a minute before saying, I hope you're not trying to pin this on me, and then blames Doug since he was the one who agreed to let Tess go in the middle of nowhere without extra protection. Earl then says Doug hated Mrs. Carlisle with a vengeance, to which Doug says, I actually like her very much. <laughs> she hate her with her f- stupid fucked oxygen tube <laughs> sucking up all of her kids and hands. <laughs> Blow her brains out right now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I did this scene did I, I said that in the text chain, but this scene definitely did remind me a lot of a bad lieutenant. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Should have that big dirty hairy pistol yeah, instead dirty, of his revolver. Pistol, that's that all got. he needed. <laughs> Funny if Doug tucked it in the front of his in pants. Front. Just, like, <laughs> it's just like He's hiding behind his the door hair. in the hospital room like a vampire when, <laughs> when Schaefer walks in. Just combing his fucking hair back. That's kind of a resort to the same tactics in this scene. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> I guess that's where he drew inspiration from. He's like, I'm going to do this yeah. thing in guarding tests. I'll do it here for so you. He, he goes a little further in this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Earl tells Schaefer about Tess tossing out the agents and how they argued all the time, but Schaefer sees through it and asks Earl why he's suddenly so upset. Then Doug makes his way towards him and says, you did it. Didn't you, Earl? And Earl tells him to get out of his face. And Schaefer says, Earl's now a suspect. And Doug asks, Where's Miss, where Mrs. Carlisle is? Earl says, speak to my lawyer, Agent Dougie. So Doug responds in the only way that one should. By pulling out his gun and putting it into Earl's head. Schaefer is, you know, remarkably calm about what's <laughs> happening right here. And, and just simply says, let's not do anything stupid here, all right? It was almost like he'd seen that several times yeah. before. Well, I mean, he's part of that. Yeah, all right, this it's, like he's, it's like negoci- you know, negotiation tactics. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Stay calm, try to defuse the situation. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it's not the first time somebody's put a gun in a suspect's face in front of Schaefer. <laughs> yeah. And it won't be the last. Doug again Also, asked I kind of think Schaefer wants the answers, too, but he needs well, to yeah. go by the procedure so he can't. Right, yeah. he, can't he can't be, be the, the one, one that does it. He doesn't want to get you know his entire career ruined by something, yeah, insane, <laughs> <laughs> bat shit crazy. <laughs> Doug again asks where Tess is, and Earl says he doesn't know. So Doug cocks his gun. Schaefer says even if Earl tells him something, they can't use it. But that gets thrown out the window like thirty seconds later. <laughs> Doug responds by saying, "I'm going to count to five, and then I'm going to shoot off your your toe." Earl screams that he doesn't know anything, and sure enough, Doug blows one of his toes off. Yeah, that's right. Like He just blows off Earl's toes with a pistol at point-blank range in front of the director of the FBI. That's when Schaefer pulls out his gun, and while sobbing, Doug tries to get the director to see it his way, while a nurse calls the police and the FBI. Doug screams that if Earl is evolved, then Tess knows it, so she's as good as dead. He counts down to five to blow off another toe while Schaefer prepares to kill Doug, but... Say what you will about his methods. Earl comes clean and tells them exactly where Tess is. Earl says his sister and her husband have Tess at an abandoned farmhouse and sobs while saying they made him do it. The FBI move in on the farm in classic 90s uh, movie (laughs) tropes. They like throw in a flashbang and it blows out the entire fucking room. (laughs) (laughs) Then they're jumping through fucking windows. (laughs) And somehow they don't shoot him. Yeah, somehow they don't shoot him. Which is it's like the most unrealistic house. part of this entire thing is that nobody <laughs> yeah. shoots the host- the hostage takers. Yeah. They're like in a 
in a tiny little cabin. <laughs> <laughs> it almost like a makeshift cabin. On With this a giant ass <laughs> barn behind them. Yeah. Anyways, they capture Earl's relatives and quickly find that Tess is buried in a hole with the PVC pipe as her only source of oxygen. Here's a quick fact. When rescuing Mrs. Carlisle from being buried, the breathing tube her kidnappers installed would have been far too long. She would have suffocated due to what's known as the dead air effect. A snorkel can only be a maximum of 16 inches before rebreathing more CO2 than fresh air becomes an issue. Uh, her breathing pipe was like well over three feet in that. Is that because CO2 is heavier than oxygen? So it mm-hmm. would just sit at the bottom of the tube and fresh air can't get down exactly. past it? Yeah. yeah. It creates a, like a barrier. She's in there deep. I don't understand. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah, yeah. I'm like, what? I, we'll get into it later. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's, it's I mean, I'm think sure the whole it's all plan was to just pull the tube up after a few days. Um, I think they were keeping her alive just in case they needed her for something. Um, but I think the plan was to bury her the whole time hmm. yeah just pull that tube up cover her up like she was never there mm-hmm, they'd true. never find her oh god though no. earl's brother-in-law says tess is alive well he's pretty sure maybe <laughs> doug the un- unhinged lunatic who fired a gun in a hospital blowing off a guy's toes freaks out and grabs the guy screaming what did you do hey, hey, what did you do what you do take it off take it easy like, who the fuck let this guy back in there? Like, what, like, <laughs> wouldn't you yeah. remove him from the situation? Because he's <laughs> extremely yeah, I, don't, I don't understand why their whole team was allowed to just yeah. sort of hang around and keep <laughs> being part of the investigation where they're the ones yeah. that lost her. Yeah. Wouldn't he technically be under arrest for shooting <laughs> yes. a suspect? Yeah, 100%. Uh, I mean, I guess it kind of makes sense since they showed up with like 400 people. That trample all over the crime scene. So, I mean, destroy all the evidence. Yeah, I guess the more the merrier at that point. I love that shot with like all of them walking down the hill. Walking down the hill towards the house. (laughs) It's all army. How many people do you need for this? (laughs) Oh, fuck. Well, they dig up Mrs. Carlisle and realize the kidnappers were never going to let her out of this hole, but only planned to keep her alive a few days. Doug, who was thrown off the crime scene like two minutes ago, shows back up and asks if, if he and his team can help dig. Schaefer <laughs> reluctantly agrees. I mean, like, couldn't I have rounded up a backhoe or something? <laughs> yeah. Like, I kind of feel like time is of the essence and mm-hmm. maybe there should be a little more urgency on their part to get her out <laughs> yeah, of Yeah, they're all just hand digging. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's just... Maybe Surprise they were they worried about collapsing it. <laughs> yeah, they should just <laughs> with their fucking heads. Yeah, that, <laughs> my like guess dogs. is they were maybe they were just worried about collapsing this makeshift hole that they had no guess, idea yeah. what the structure of it was mm-hmm. like. So. Yeah, they don't really know what's at the bottom of the hole at this point. Like, yeah, they just know there's a tube down to her, mm-hmm. or how she might just is. be in the hole. You know? <laughs> yeah. What's in the hole? What's in the hole? <laughs> Ryan Reynolds <laughs> <laughs> did a whole movie about. It. Oh, that's true. I forgot about that movie. Very. <laughs> <laughs> well, they finally get to her like four hours later and find her unconscious in a wooden box. Doug yells, somebody get a power saw. And that's a young Barack Obama to fetch some soap, water and blankets so no one could see her. In this state. <laughs> I, I, yeah. <laughs> He's just kind of like wanted to wash her up and. Make her yeah, but then they clearly show her just in a stretcher. Like the, the AEMTs aren't going to wait for her for them to like wash her face. <laughs> you don't know, dude. <laughs> they might. That's what's most important right now. Just <laughs> make sure, you know, not to make sure that she's breathing or anything. Just, you know, she can't look dirty. <laughs> There's going to be cameras like on her. spitting on a washcloth. <laughs> <laughs> Get that hairdresser on the call. <laughs> we need her down here now. Where's our hairdresser? Get her down here now. <laughs> Corpse can't look ugly. <laughs> uh, well, the FBI pull her out of the barn on a stretcher and put her onto a helicopter where all the top brass jump on without Doug and his team, who say they'll just drive to the hospital. The helicopter <laughs> takes off to Jurassic Park music for some reason. <laughs> dun, 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 I, de- dun, I don't know if you guys dun, noticed dun, that, dun, but it definitely sounded like the... <laughs> It's, it sounded it very reminiscent of the helicopters from yeah. flying off from Jurassic Park yeah. or landing in Jurassic Park. Yeah. 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 Which only came out a year after this. So I'm telling you. Yeah. Or a year before this. So yeah. maybe they were trying yeah. to do an homage. <laughs> they definitely were. <laughs> Anyways, after that music starts playing, 
The helicopter quickly lands, and everyone on the ground plays a fun game of telephone as they call for Doug to get to the chopper. Tess says she's not going anywhere without her security detail, so they all the top brass have to get off the helicopter to make way for Doug and his team. All the higher-ups give Doug a look, including Dale Dye, who spits in Doug's face and says, You disgust me! And Doug's just kind of like, blows off one of his toes. It's kind of a <laughs> weird fucking moment, but I guess... <laughs> no, that last part didn't happen. But they do give him looks of disgust, like, oh, fuck this guy and his team. On the helicopter, Tess asked how long it took Doug to figure out the cigarette burns and scolds him for taking so long. Then she pulls his face down onto hers and they share a passionate kiss for, like, way too long. And, like, fucking tongues everywhere, too. Wait, no, that's just a fanfic I'm writing. Well, well a Whitney Houston song plays. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh... Yeah. <laughs> uh, Same no, thing Schaefer happened t- in Driving Miss Daisy. <laughs> <Weird>. <laughs> no, what actually happens is Schaefer tells her the only reason they found her is because Doug shot a man in the hospital. <laughs> and she's stoked that Doug finally got to fire his gun. She's <laughs> fucking just fun stuff all around. <laughs> Later, we see Tess getting ready to leave the hospital where she gets a call from the president. She tells him she wants Doug taken care of. And the president says, Doug fired a gun in a crowded hospital, but since he saved her life, Doug is like a sunder. Uh, she also tells him if anything happens to her, she wants Doug to be looked after, and then she just hangs up on him. Like a real She's power like move right there. The only person who can browbeat the president. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's We've like, seen uh, just browbeating uh, uh. Doug a couple of times <laughs> yeah. in the movie. Yeah. He's like, uh, uh, <laughs> can see uh, why uh, he's uh, the one who. <laughs> yeah, he's like she. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say like. She always reads him the riot act, which is why he always has to call Doug and complain about it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> read him the riot act. Yeah, it's true what they say: shit rolls downhill. <laughs> Outside the room, Mrs. Carlisle protests that she's not leaving the hospital in a wheelchair, while an orderly argues that it's policy. Doug giggles while listening to the argument for a minute before whistling and saying, "The regulations aren't really that sacred, are they?" To the orderly, and then pulls down his sunglasses like he's checking out the Willie's Wonderland sign <laughs> before saying, "And Tess." Get in the goddamn chair. <laughs> What's yeah. funny is he just like went through this major horrible ordeal that would have been prevented had he followed the regulations that he yeah. was so strict about at the beginning. And now he's like, oh, the regulations aren't that strict, are they? <laughs> well, it's it's character growth. Like there's some things you can fudge. She can clearly yeah. walk out. If he had followed the regulations, he wouldn't have shot the guy's toe off to get the information out of her yeah. <laughs> or to get the information out of him to find out where she was in the first place. Yeah. But yeah. then also he talks back to her, you know, calls her test for the first time in the movie. The only time in the movie. Yeah. Yeah. So sort of to show the completion of his character arc. Like, <laughs> yeah. He's, yeah, they're, they're friends and he doesn't have to be so, anal about all the regulations mm-hmm. well she's he's take- gonna give her the anal later <laughs> <laughs> oh god damn wear it. that red dress into the kitchen again <laughs> oh my god <laughs> bring the cigarette lighter <laughs> <laughs> she's taking a back but reluctantly gets in the chair where she smiles to herself and pats doug's arm while saying very good douglas Outside the hospital, the press are waiting and applauding the former first lady for having not been killed. She blows <laughs> kisses at them. Happy to be back in the limelight for the last few weeks of her life before dying an agonizing, painful death from a brain tumor at the size of a golf ball. <laughs> the end. Happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you just don't think about it, it's a pretty happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> Doug Chesnick has a ton of time to kill waiting around for any hint of action while guarding a hermit old lady who sits around all day scrapbooking and watching old videos from her days in the spotlight. And there's no better way to pass the hours of boredom than expanding his mind listening to audiobooks from Libro.fm. Plus, it'll help drown out listening to Earl and Uncle Dursley all day. Libro FM has a huge selection of audiobooks, so whether you're into the classics like Mrs. Carlyle, or you're more of a Mr. Ed type of guy like Doug, you'll be able to find something you'll love. In fact, you can choose from over 250,000 audiobooks on Libro.fm, including bestsellers, new releases, and even audiobooks for kids. 
And if you're watching or listening in the US or Canada, you can get two for the price of one with your first month of membership on Libro.fm by using our coupon code CAGE at checkout. We have a couple of questions before we move on. Um, I don't have many questions, but um, one I was uh, I wasn't sure about was why was she so upset when he asked her if what she was watching was better than Mister Ed because she was like watching something about the Royals, uh, guessing it was a something from the presidency <sighs> um, and thinking about better times, but she was like weirdly like very stoic and like didn't even look at him and just flipped off the TV and I don't know. I think she was just in not in a joking mood. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like he was contemplating life and her life and death and or impending death and all that. And how she's been relegated to living in this room, but she used to be able to go to functions like that. And I don't think he picked up on it. So Mm. Because he didn't really okay. see what she was, or he guess he saw what she was watching, but probably didn't understand why she was watching it. Yeah. I do like um, <clears throat> that they didn't just immediately make that switch of yeah. like when uh, they have their conversation in the bar and all that kind of stuff. It isn't like they're just best buds after mm-hmm. that. Like she's yeah. still contemptuous and like mm-hmm. <laughs> pushing but, uh, back they're, at him. They're friends enough that he can make that joke. He couldn't crack, he wouldn't have cracked that joke at the start of the, the movie. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know. Uh, but then he also understands when she doesn't joke back. He just kind of like, okay, I'll give her a space. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, yeah. I think maybe her just looking back on better times and like, God, things used to be good. And now I'm dying and mm-hmm. I have to live in this goddamn house. If kids don't even talk to her, <laughs> yeah. come spend time with, she's got no one to spend time with. Mm-hmm. And that <clears throat> is, is kind of her surrogate child mm-hmm. at this point. Now. Yeah. Um, how are they suddenly able to use the information Earl gave them after Schaefer said that they wouldn't be able to? I think he just meant they couldn't use it in court. Like, yeah, it was under duress, but they could use it in part of the active investigation just to find her. And that's all Doug just, cared about. Does that mean that Earl is going to get off scot-free? <laughs> Maybe. I think, I think Earl's, yeah, I think Earl's. I mean, I'm assuming future. he would take some kind of plea deal and just mark out his, his brother and her sister mm-hmm. and brother-in-law since they were the ones that put him up to it. It did seem like they put him up to it and he was just weaselly enough to not to go along with it. Um, yeah. Like I said, yeah. the $15 million seems pretty steep for, but it, you know, <laughs> they're idiots. <laughs> yeah. I guess. Like real they're salt dumb. of the earth. Yeah. They're, yeah, yeah, they're real salt of the earth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ohio farm people. <laughs> just, we want safe drinking water. That's all we want. <laughs> <laughs> they're like keep her enough to put in a well we're never gonna meet your demands just keep her I, I mean I would assume that they would expect them to lowball them or I don't know maybe they wanted it to seem like a terrorist organization and if they'd only asked for like two million dollars that something would have been up you know yeah I guess that makes sense they wanted it to seem like a big time operation rather than just two yokels kidnapping her mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's see, I know she made a call to the president and all, but like, wouldn't Doug's career be completely over after yeah. that whole hospital debacle? That was my main question. <laughs> no, because he would, he's, he's going to get a presidential pardon at that point. I, know, I don't think still, he'd be charged. Like, who wants to hire this guy? <laughs> yeah. after I don't think I mean, it's even discounting the fact that he shot Earl's foot. Like he lost her. Like he failed his job as the head of secret security. Yeah. So why does he even get to keep working in secret security or uh, secret service? So, and I assume uh, this is just my head canon is that he works for Tess until she dies, yeah. and then he's fired from the secret yeah. service. Right. <laughs> well, I figured she hired him all on his private security instead, and then uh, yeah, maybe she was just telling the president, like, "Hey, when I die." take care of this guy, make sure he gets a nice job or something or pension or whatever, just to make sure that he's, cause she knows he's not going to be able to work as a secret service agent <laughs> <Yeah>. again. <laughs> you probably just I send mean, him over like, to CIA. He could go interrogate people. If we hadn't shown him like actually shooting Earl, like, we just had to like put the gun to his head and, and then he gets the confession. Like 
it would have yeah. been okay. But like the fact that he actually <laughs> fires the gun in a hospital <laughs> and blows off a guy's toe is like. <laughs> really I think it's just to show stepping. he's that desperate to find out where she is because mm-hmm. he knows she's gonna die. So he doesn't yeah. really care if he goes to prison for shooting this guy or it screws their investigation up. He only cares about finding her, and he's so pissed. He doesn't like Earl anyway, so. Maybe he's always wanted to shoot her. Yeah. <laughs> it's always dreamed of shooting this guy. <laughs> <laughs> he almost beats him up. When yeah. He says he's fired. <laughs> yeah. This is maybe that's, this is just all of those incidents <laughs> boiling to it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't, I don't know, man. <laughs> I just can't see him like actually being able to keep his job after this. <laughs> In any capacity. Yeah. Really. I mean, at the very least, Earl could probably sue him for shooting him. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> That's all I really have um, as far as questions. I feel like the movie was pretty well, like, contained. There weren't, like, a ton of things where I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Uh, the only other one I had was when when they followed her car to the doctor's office. Like, wouldn't. Why did nobody figure out that she was there for a brain tumor? Like they, we don't really see that it's a doctor's office from the outside, but like there's got to be signage saying, you know, yeah, <laughs> oncology department or something that the rest of them would have picked up on. Like she was going there for a, some kind of an appointment, unless Doug or someone knows that and they just keep it under under mm-hmm. wraps and they don't say anything about it. It just seemed like that was kind of a weird thing to sort of cover up or not explain fully because they're obviously there with her when she goes in they don't follow her in but they can sort of piece together that she's there for some kind of cancer appointment yeah unless it's a completely unmarked building which would be bizarre for a medical (laughs) facility yeah yeah (laughs) to me it seemed like it was like maybe one of those multi-use office buildings and they weren't sure exactly what office she was going to but i also kind of got the sense that doug knew um, and that he wasn't saying anything because of the whole thing with the president's affairs and yeah, stuff. Like it can be discreet. Yeah, he's very discreet about this. And like when he's told later on in the by Schaefer uh, that they that she had an inoperable brain tumor, he kind of gives a look like he he already knew. I mean, she did literally tell him to his face yeah. that she had an inoperable brain tumor, but he's you know it's. It's painted to us like he thought she was joking, but maybe mm-hmm. he knew. Maybe he knew all along. He pieced he together the before stuff that. after the fact, yeah. Because <clears throat> if we go by the rationale that the first time that Earl took off with her was to get her checked out to see if she had the brain tumor, um, then he might have pieced it together then, figured it all out. I guess another one, why were any of them allowed to be around during the investigation when the rest of secret service and the CIA and the FBI all came in, like wouldn't they have all been taken at least into questioning and not (laughs) removed and and been completely removed and potentially treated as suspects. Cause it's like, why were none of you around when this happened? Are you all collaborating or something weird going on that said they're just sort of allowed to hang out, but just not be involved. It just seemed kind of bizarre. (laughs) Yeah. I find that incredibly unrealistic. Uh, (laughs) At the very least, I think Doug would have been dismissed and sent back to, you know, disciplinary actions before his boss for failing at his job uh, and probably removed off of it entirely. I mean, especially after he shoots off Earl's toe. At that point, it's like, get this fucking man off the street. Yeah. 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 (laughs) It's time to keep track. Here are the final stats. This one is a PG-13 movie, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it was it was noticeably light on curses. There was only nine total, but um, we had two dams and four goddams. We had one shit, which I think is I can't we we pointed that out in the breakdown, but I can't remember when. I think it's when he's talking about uh when she's trying to call him up to the office or call him back up to her room or something. I'm trying mm-hmm. to remember when, and he's uh, something. We want to be down there. Yeah, that's it. You're in that. I'm doing this shit. <laughs> Uh, one use of God in a curse perjur- pejorative sense and one fuck, which is what he says. If they're going to fucking kill her or whatever, or she's mm-hmm. fucking dead. If they know that yeah, she knows Earl's involved. I think you're allowed what one, one fuck in a PG 13. Yeah. I think that was the right moment to use it in that yeah. movie. Mm. <laughs> sort of when he's at his most desperate. Uh, I just watched, um, 
and gentle, but uh, I just watched Guardians of the Galaxy 3, and there is a fuck in the movie. <laughs> oh, so wow. like, whoa, hold on. <laughs> so they, they released that as a clip, but they bleeped it, and then they, James Gunn said, like, oh, that's actually in the movie, but it was like people were debating whether or not it actually was fuck, or if he says some, like, made-up word. Uh, yeah, no, there's, there's a real fuck in the, in the movie. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Which I was, like, blown away by and uh you know these marvel movies are all pg-13 yeah mm-hmm. uh aside from <clears throat> you know like the um the deadpool, <laughs> deadpool. and logan and the, yeah. those mm-hmm. those movies which haven't been mcu specific so like this is the first mcu movie to use a fuck which yeah. uh, was uh That's, shocking uh, in yeah. the moment <laughs> but hilarious <laughs> at the same time i don't know yeah, I mean, maybe they just don't care as much because Deadpool 3 is going to be R-rated and, and stuff, so they're just sort of loosening those restrictions up a bit. Plus, it's Such James a, Gunn, so yeah, they're just James like, let Gunn, him do whatever. I think uh, he, he probably pushed pretty hard for that. He just probably just wanted to be able to say I was able to get an F yeah. bomb in, in one of my MCU movies. Yeah. Anyway, so that's nine for this movie. That brings our total up to 632 curses. 632. I kind of wish I'd started tracking crap because they say it in a couple of stuff, but I I count God as a curse, but not crap. It's kind of arbitrary, but uh, I think damn is like the lightest you can really go on. Yes. Runtime on this 95 minutes. So it was kind of on the low end, Um, especially for this season. We have some pretty long movies so far this, this Mm. season, Um, but 95 minutes, our next movie, uh, Mom and Dad is also right in that same wheelhouse, like ninety six minutes. Um, so we get a couple, couple short ones here. This was a PG thirteen movie, so there was no nudity. I think you can have nudity of some sort, but I don't think. <laughs> like, where in guarding Tess would yeah. we, where would we put some? <laughs> we were nudity? so close when he was on the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> As far as our, our state and country tracker, this is our second time to Ohio. Uh, dog Eat Dog was our first time. <laughs> <laughs> we spent almost that entire movie in Cleveland, I believe. Um, and then this one is in Columbus. So we've, if we head to Akron at some point, we've hit all of the major Ohio <laughs> spots. Um, and we also briefly were in Washington, D.C., which I think is the third time that we've been to D.C. Just watched National Treasure. Back in D.C. again. <laughs> National Tra- Book of Secrets. <laughs> Basically the same movie a second time, but uh, slightly different locations. Wash, rinse, repeat. I do. Uh, I don't know if you guys heard it, but uh, somebody asked uh, why uh, Bruckheimer <laughs> wanted to go back to the well and do a third movie um, because he's been pushing very hard to get National Treasure 3 made, and he said, I have... 47 reasons uh, why I'd want to make this movie. And if you watch Book of Secrets, it's because the president asks Cage's character about page 47 of the presidential's Book of Secrets. Um, so apparently that's the plot of the next movie, if and <laughs> when it ever gets made. It's mm-hmm. going to be about whatever was on page 47. <laughs> I, I feel like I feel like it will. Because Cage is just having this huge renaissance right now. I mean, Jesus. Yeah. Like he's in the air. Renfeld the, I don't think didn't the, do well. No. I don't think the National Treasure show did well for Disney Plus. So No, no but it's because that, everybody wanted Nick Cage in the original cast back. Maybe. That is true. <laughs> so um, I know that's I saw what a lot I've of read about was it. like yeah. everybody was like why like why would you even make this piece of crap yeah. without Nick Cage? So. Yeah. Um, from what I heard, the show isn't bad. It's just everybody was like, why would you not include Nick Cage right, with this? Right. That's mm-hmm. why we That's like this. They, yes, exactly. That's why they love it. But I yeah. mean, I, I just feel like people are going to want to push and try to <laughs> capitalize on his popularity right now. But Renfield's not a movie that's going to do well in theaters. That's going to be something that does well on VOD. Um, yeah. I mean, if you really look at like, a lot of the movies that have been coming out, unless you're a kid's movie or a Marvel movie, you're not, exactly, you're yeah. not crushing the box office anymore. I mean, that's something to be said about putting out a National Treasure movie right now is that a National Treasure movie would do very oh well. Oh, my God, yeah. Office, which Book of Secrets is not a great movie, but it made it over made, $400 million. Yes, dollars. Uh, it made a ton of freaking money, and it's still adored to this day. Yeah, so, and, I, you know, I, I I really would actually love to see <laughs> distinguished older 
Ben Gates. I think it would mm-hmm. be really interesting to see. Um, I don't know. Just just tell Riley to shut the fuck up. Now. Well, Riley's <laughs> clearly dead. He made some bad crypto deals <laughs> and some NFT deals went south, and he's dead. So I mean, he's in uh, the TV series, so. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's pre crypto. (laughs) (laughs) Now we just have Darcy from the MCU replace him. (laughs) Yeah. Just just swap those two out. Nobody would even notice. Uh budget versus gross on this movie. Twenty million dollar budget, which is a lot for nineteen ninety four for a pretty simple story, pretty self contained little like almost the entire movie takes place at that little farmhouse. Mm -hmm. you know, her Carlisle house. Um, I'm not really sure why it costs that much. It probably a yeah, cage and Shirley McLean. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Got to imagine they got paid pretty well for this. Mm-hmm. Probably at least 5 million each. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like that's half million. the budget right there. Yeah. It made $31 million though. Um, so, you know, made back its budget, but you know, we've, we've talked about this many times. You kind of had it to double or even triple budget to make up for you know uh the promotion of it the advertising all that kind of stuff theater th- theater fees or theater mm-hmm. cut. Fees. uh back in those days uh projector fees were very expensive as well oh yeah um cuz you had to press the film onto film <laughs> and send those out in reels to everybody <laughs> nowadays it's like a big hard drive mm-hmm. um but Back then, it was very expensive to create all of that and send all of those out to, you know, 150, 300 theaters or whatever. Uh, 94, I feel like there were less theaters, but uh, still a lot of money. That brings our grand total up to $1.072.7 billion on the budget and $2.383 billion on the gross. Um, Once we hit Book of Secrets, I feel like we're going to take another big jump. Oh, yeah. That movie made an an astounding amount of money. (laughs) (laughs) Um, As far as our top grossing films, this is kind of in the middle, $31 million, sandwiched between Raising Arizona and The Wicker Man (laughs) for top grossing. (laughs) What a a sandwich. Yeah, Yeah, I think it's like the 10th, 10th highest. It's pretty crazy. Like there's... (laughs) 100, 200, 300 million dollar movies in there. And then within the top 10 is a 31 million dollar movie. Speaks to Cage's kind of range of movies that he's done as far as like indie and big budget blockbuster movies all over the map. Um, as far as ratings, this is our ninth PG 13 uh, movie that we've done so far. Uh, bringing our grand total up to two PGs, nine PG-13s, 20 R-rated, and six unrated films. Which leads us to the Kill Tracker. Uh, this one was super easy, guys. Uh, it was just one toe. He killed one toe. <laughs> <laughs> Not, he, no, no kills in this movie, which I kind of expected. I didn't expect him to be murdering anybody. I wasn't expecting him to blow off somebody's toe either, but you know. <laughs> so zero kills. Killed so we're still at one. <laughs> we're still 179 for kills over the what 30 some movies we've done. 37, I believe. 37. 37. 37. <laughs> and then uh zero deaths. He didn't die. So still only eleven deaths in uh the thirty seven films we've we've watched. It's oh. another reference that is probably being lost to the to time. Go watch Clerks, <laughs> you fucks. <laughs> Go watch Clerks. <laughs> God damn it. Where does this masterpiece fall? Let's rank this film on the K-Jometer. All right. That uh, leads us over to the most important question. Uh, Vince, where does Guarding Test from 1994, one of Javi's favorite films... From unbearable weight of massive talent, <laughs> right on your cageometer. I'm gonna keep Javi's, uh, you know, opinion out of this one and influence <laughs> out of this. Uh, honestly, this movie was very. It was a pleasant surprise. I wasn't expecting to enjoy it as much as I did. I can't. I'm not sure if I've ever seen it before. I feel like I have a long time ago, but it didn't leave enough residue to to kind of like resonate with me down the road but uh 
yeah, so I'm going to give it a seven. I thought it was a pretty, pretty well told story. Um, I thought the chemistry between all the actors was really good. The twist, that dark twist at the end was not expecting that. So I definitely enjoyed that. It wasn't just this kind of bland driving Miss Daisy, like vanilla story. As far as Cage goes, give him a seven as well. He had his cagey moments, which were hilarious, and I'm, I love I love those. I'm glad that they were in there because it made him more entertaining. But then I thought what well, really kind of solidified the seven for me is just his chemistry with uh, Tess and the watching them start to grow and bond their relationship down the road to then her being kidnapped and seeing the true agony on his face when he realizes how fucked he is and how devastated he is that she's gone. Um, those, those are, that's what really, that relationship is what really cemented my, my opinion on his performance in the movie. Cause if it were just up to, if he hadn't had that sincerity and that chemistry, I think it would have probably been about a four, maybe a five because he gets a little cagey and there's some moments where it just it wasn't really clicking early on in the film. I don't know if those were some of the first scenes that they shot, but he didn't really seem to be in a rhythm or in the character at the, at that time. But just watching that bond and that chemistry, I, I I think he did a really good job. It's one of the better performances that we've seen probably this season. And maybe I'm just biased because we just watched Time to Kill. It was our last one. But <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so seven for yeah. both, both movie and Cage. He was good in Time to Kill. Come on. Yeah, yeah. He, he was. Uh, all right. Uh, Nigel, where does guarding Tess rate on your cageometer? I thought this movie was great. I, I feel like a lot of the critical response when it came out is a little harsh and the audience response too. I don't really understand um, where that mixed review status comes from. I mean, it's, it's not horrible, but it's like 50% of the people who review it seem to at least 50% say, yeah, they don't like it, which I kind of found weird. I don't know what, what it is. It's not, it's not a movie that I would choose to watch um, if it weren't for the show, but I was very pleasantly surprised by it. I think this is one of those um, hidden gems that we come across doing mm-hmm. the show. And it may just be because I'm jaded with movies this season, like stolen and arsenal and <laughs> <laughs> some real <laughs> shitty performances we've seen in the last <laughs> few episodes. Yeah. But I thought this one was an eight out of 10. Um, I, I debated giving it a nine, but wow. uh, I, yeah, like I, I just, I felt like it worked. I felt like the movie was, was really solid. Uh, uh, I'll give it, I, I kind of backed it down a little bit as we were discussing it because of the inconsistencies with the end. Like it's a little unrealistic that he would go off on the deep end and shoot this guy and then have no repercussions from it and stuff. But um, as far as the movie itself, I think it, it told a contained story that it wanted to tell. It's really this, this exploration of these two characters and their relationship with each other. And we, we through the pacing of the film, we sort of learn something about each of them in each scene as it goes along and their relationship evolves as we gain a better understanding of it and uh, kind of coalesces around uh, it coalesces in the end with a complete character arc for both of them. And we have a broader understanding uh, of them. So I've noticed that I really enjoy these types of movies for Nicolas Cage because I feel like he can really show off his um I, th- I think this is where he's the strongest and it, it's kind of a shame that he got known for blockbusters and kind of crazy over the top manic acting. Cause I feel like movies like this and the family man and, uh, uh Mastic man and Weatherman, he's, he's much better at, I think his performances are a lot more enjoyable. Um, so I gave him an eight as well, uh, for this, uh, again, I almost gave him a nine for it, but uh, I feel like there was just a couple of moments where he wasn't quite fitting, um, like Vince you said, want to be down there. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was just like yeah. it's that classic caginess, but it felt a little bit uh, out of character for it. But in general, yeah. I think he, he does a really good job of um, conveying all of the emotions that this character feels as you're watching it. You can you can look at any scene that he's in and pinpoint what he's feeling and what he's going through, and and it feels like a realistic portrayal uh, of this character, Doug, um, and his relationship. Of, with Tess. <clears throat> uh, and again, I think that that chemistry he had with Shirley uh, McLean comes through uh, on screen. And I think that really lends to the success of the movie and why it works uh, as, as well as it does. And uh, yeah, I, I was, I really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Um, I also, I in general, I just wanted to point out, that I liked the dark twist that it took. It kind of felt <laughs> like it was steering you down, you know, this typical, Oh, she's got brain cancer and she's going to, 
die of a tumor and where it's going to be sad and a tearjerker, but then it veered off in the other direction. And um, those threads were there as the movie went along, you know, with, with the way that she runs off with Earl and how Doug doesn't trust Earl. And, um, you know, she doesn't believe that the security detail is necessary, but he does. But maybe he, you know, he could slack off a little bit because maybe she's got a point. Uh, and we turned out, no, he was right all along and he's sort of been right this whole time. And he's a very skilled um, agent and what he does. So I felt like a twist was there. It's just if you weren't looking for it, you wouldn't have noticed it, which I think is a really good twist to a film. Um, yeah. And I don't think it was too bombastic of an ending. It, it's kind of a, <laughs> I mean, it's a little bit over the top with we said there's like 500 people descending on the barn and it's just but even then it's not like a big over the top action scene it's just a just to show this response of like how how, how much the story has veered from this small character driven thing to like she's been kidnapped and there's a full on response to get it or to, to get her back and rescue her and stuff and it feels sort of <laughs> out of the element that maybe Doug feels like too being stuck in this small town for three years or whatever it's been. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, he wanted that type of life and he got it <laughs> toward the end. He wanted that kind of response. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, um, I'm kind of disappointed that this wasn't more popular. I, I have honestly never heard of it except until we watched uh, unbearable weight and it was mentioned in there and a couple of scenes were shown in it. So this one is sort of flown under the radar. I don't know if that's just at the time. This was like you said, this was a tail end of a bunch of movies that did this and it was sort of cliche at the time. So maybe that was explained some of the response and I haven't seen driving miss Daisy or, or the bodyguard and stuff. Although Amazon recommended both of those once this movie wrapped up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I guess that could be a part of it, but I think for the movie that it was what it set out to do, it was great. It, it did that really well. I'd say um, <laughs> you, you wouldn't expect this from me, but I fucking love Driving Miss Daisy. <laughs> I think it's a genius movie. Uh, really well done. And like it's it's definitely worth a watch if you haven't seen it. So I would I would highly recommend it right. as um, echoes of like, I don't know. It just it's one of those movies that's like it's sad, um, but it's really enjoyable at the same time i don't know <clears throat> it's one of those movies that if it's on i will watch it like if shawshank mm -hmm. redemption is on i will watch it every mm -hmm. single time um and if driving miss daisy's on i will watch it every single time guarding test not so much <laughs> <laughs> i can see that but i i know i liked it it's not a movie that i would go out of my way to see but i appreciated it for what it was and i found myself enjoying it quite a bit I love this part of the show of like you know finding the 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 movies you didn't expect to be great um like last season, I feel like it was the trust, you know, yeah, <laughs> like yeah, a movie that uh, we didn't expect to be good. Um, uh, and then, you know, Mandy, we were like blown away by how fucking great it was mm -hmm. in the first season. A pig, you know, pig, yeah. Um, I was like, I have seen this movie, and I think maybe my uh, my feelings skewed it, you know, just because I'd seen it quite a few times, like when it first came out. I think it was, like I said, it was one of those movies that was just on a lot. I like, I can't be quite as generous, but I do think it's a great self-contained small story. Um, the tonal shift at the end uh, is just kind of like whiplash a little bit. Um, I like that it it took you in a place you weren't expecting. Um, but I do feel like it's just so unrealistic uh, from the point where he blows off Earl's toe. <laughs> uh, like I said while we were talking about it, like if he just would have just threatened him and that's how that scene ended, everything else would have been much more believable. But like the fact that he blew off his fucking toe yeah. in a crowded hospital <laughs> with the fucking FBI guy watching on, like I just feel like Doug's everything would have come to a grind, grinding halt at that point. Like, yeah. Doug is not allowed to be anywhere near this woman ever again. <laughs> <laughs> like, that is, you just went way over the fucking line. Um, so I gave the movie a seven, um, mostly just because of that ending. I feel like everything else is really well done. It's a relatively short movie. It's only 95 minutes, so the pacing is is well done. Um, I feel like they did a great job of building up that relationship. And like you guys said, the chemistry between Shirley MacLaine and Nick Cage was great. Obviously, they really liked each other. 
off camera as well because they adopted a ferret and a zebra <laughs> <laughs> together. Um, and she like she has to have that gravitas in mm-hmm. order to make that character believable. And Shirley MacLaine is amazing in this. Mm-hmm. And it's no surprise that she got a Golden Globe nomination for this. Um, she lost out to uh, Jamie Lee Curtis for True Lies, that mm. uh, Best Actress uh, Golden Globe. I don't think either one of them were Oscar nominated that year, though. But um, <clears throat> anyway, she she's amazing in it. I feel like she is the 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 real breakout performance in this. You know, Shirley MacLaine though. I yeah, mean, she's the Oscar <laughs> winner. She's I think she got five uh, Oscar nominations throughout her career. So it's not not a shock, but mm-hmm. yeah, without her, this movie falls apart. Um, yeah, yeah, she is definitely the the most important piece to this whole thing. Cage's character, it's great to have that. Like, you know, he he's being antagonized by her constantly, and he has to like <laughs> catch himself over and over and over again to not fly off the rails and i think he did a really good job of that and i think his his portrayal was believable like you can tell that he cares about her from the jump like when he Mm -hmm. uh first goes upstairs to tell her that he's going you can tell that he cares about her and he he's conflicted about leaving her behind but at the same time he's like she just keeps pushing me and i she obviously doesn't like me being around so i want to get out of here anyway why does she want me back in you know so uh, I also gave him a seven. Um, I didn't. Uh, I, I think some of those cagey moments were a little too cagey. We want to be down there. That yeah. thing uh, <laughs> when he's screaming about just sending Earl to the office, um, uh, and then <laughs> in the final couple of scenes. So I mean, he does like when he's sobbing in the in the hospital after he's done this thing to Earl, like I felt like that was pretty fucking believable. Mm -hmm. Like I, he, he loves her so much, obviously that he's willing to completely sacrifice basically his entire life in order to make sure that she gets found uh, before she dies. Cause he knows that she doesn't have a a chance of living because she knows her Mm -hmm. kidnapper and she can identify him. Yep. So she's going to die no matter what, unless they can find out where she is immediately, mm-hmm. um, which was like within the first 24 hours. Like, I think he says yeah. 22 minutes, 30 seconds, yeah. 30 yeah. minutes. <laughs> yeah. 22 hours, 30 minutes. That's why I wasn't so uh, against him shooting the guy in the foot. Like it, it felt like you had, <laughs> it, it really conveyed what you were supposed to get out of that, which is he's, <sighs> Like he's willing to do anything up to and potentially killing this guy to get mm-hmm. her back. Like, you know, yeah. torpedoing his career, ending up in prison. All that doesn't matter. Like just, <laughs> just to find so out where she is. Up. I feel like uh, <laughs> not just the fact that he blows off his toe, but the fact that he fired a gun in a hospital. <laughs> uh, yeah. I feel like that was the part where I was like, OK, Jesus Christ, this is a lot. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they could have potentially done the same thing if he just like missed the guy, like shot next to his foot yes. to get him to talk, something like that. But I think it was also, I mean, it also kind of reduced. Like, I don't know. I feel like it, again, it, it they needed. It, I like that they showed that he was willing to <laughs> shoot this guy to, to figure it out. You know, yeah, um, to get back to it. I guess it's not, good. and it's also again, he's th- that's not part of the regulations. That's not by the book. Yeah, and that's sort of what he's been hammering in throughout going up to this point is like he needs to follow things by the book and do the procedure, mm-hmm. and he's diverted from it <laughs> because it's for something he really cares about, and he's really trying to to save her life. So I don't feel like it's it's necessarily what he did to Earl. It's the fact that he's still able to be involved yeah. in everything after that is the part that I find just very unbelievable. <laughs> so I feel like- Maybe they cut some bits out. But they could have explained that like the president and the FBI guy and uh, Tess all kind of covered for him and saved it, covered it up and saved his career from yeah, maybe. going yeah, down, something down, like down that the tubes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know. Bullets don't stop. Um, so I could have gone through to another room downstairs. Yep. I don't know. Anyways, I, I just feel like, uh, that's seven out of 10 is still a pretty good score, but you know, there's so few things that, that take it down just to, just a touch for me. Um, overall, I felt like it was a great movie. I hadn't seen this movie in a long time. Um, I think 
it had probably been since the 90s that I'd seen it. Um, but I remembered liking it. I just didn't remember it being like super memorable. Um, so yeah, seven seven out of ten, I feel like is yeah, that's the right score. Here it is, the moment you've all been waiting for. These are the cagiest moments of the film. I want you to go in there and tell Earl to meet me in the office. Okay, Lee? All right. Thank you. Hmm. Well, no more questions, but we're going to have to have you available to us, Mr. Fowler, at our convenience. All right? Uh, I'm telling you to holster your pistol. Jesus, help me. God damn it, Doug. Put that gun away. He is a driver in the employ of the Secret Service. I can't do anything about the cook and the nurse. No, they work for you. But this guy works for us, and he's gone! I'm going to count to five, and then I'm going to shoot one of your toes off. Listen, I don't know anything. Will you just get that to your... Ah! 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 Are you crazy? Ah! Are you... It's death! Somebody get a power saw! Okay. Got it! Come on, move! Oh, he is involved! And she knows it! Uh, and if she knows it, her life is worthless, uh, you understand me? They have to fucking kill her! We don't have time to meet his lawyer, right, Earl? Oh, God, help me! Five! Doug! Four! No! No! Oh, three, okay! Two! Okay! 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 That's it for this episode of One Cage at a Time. As always, be sure to drop us an email at onecagepodcast at gmail.com to let us know if we missed anything or hit us up with suggestions to improve the show, comments, compliments, or simply to gush about the legend that is Nicolas Cage. Uh, Next up, we'll be watching the 2017 horror film, which many people have credited as the beginning of Nicolas Cage's recent comeback, uh, Mom and Dad, which... um, uh, that was like the first time I heard him applauded for one of these horror movies. Um, and then this movie kind of led to Mandy. And I feel like Mandy was the, the beginning of him, his renaissance. Um, but <laughs> he's very cagey. <laughs> Extremely cagey. <laughs> A uh, mysterious illness infects parents worldwide that switches their paternal instincts into violent rage giving them an uncontrollable urge to brutally murder their children. This will be a great movie for Nigel to watch with a, <laughs> with a uh, toddler and a baby on the way. Uh, I'm sorry, Nigel. This feels like bad timing. <laughs> I don't feel like this was a good movie for us to be watching this season. But uh, we're going to soldier on. We're going to power through it. Um, Nigel, you might even have like more... Uh, insight into this than we do uh so um. anyways it was directed by one half of the team that brought us ghost rider spirit of vengeance uh, so that would only make sense that the guy that uh helped to torpedo nick's career uh, would be the one who kind of put him on the path of resurrection Anyways, make sure to check it out wherever fine films are sold or on your streaming service of choice. Until then, we'll say goodbye the way we do each and every episode with our Nicolas Cage quote of the film. Uh, is there any she report where the first lady is? Was she Chocolate? With the president Some kind of goddamn food drink or something? I what do we look like, waiters? Are we a bunch of waiters? I we want to be down there! Some sort of charity. Thanks for listening to One Cage at a Time. Visit us online at onecageatatime.com or follow us on the social media platform of your choice for more Nicolas Cage goodness. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you really like the show, become a member of our Patreon where you can download unedited and ad-free episodes as well as listen to our follow-up show, Back Into the Cage, where we re-examine each movie to discuss what we missed the first time around, answer listener questions, and wax poetic about the man, the myth, the legend that is Nicolas Cage. <laughs>